of what they refer to as female nature, when in fact this mindset is a product of complex, lifelong social engineering that affects the vast majority of women and most certainly is not the nature of the female of our species, as I'm going to get into in a future slide. Well, social engineering is a form of mass trauma that's taking place against the psyche of the female of our species, okay? And it is the reason that these behaviors manifest themselves. It is not there, that way from birth. If we're not continuously repressing true human female nature, the, the inauthentic women would not be behaving the way that they do in our society. This is the problem with their analysis. They understand the symptoms, but they do not understand social engineering as the causal factor. They're correct in their analysis, incorrect in their causal factor analysis, and incorrect certainly in their solutions. And you know what? Most men want no part of that work, and most women don't want to hear it. The following is a quote from our next speaker. Get as offended as you like. Needless to say, he tells it like it is. And I have the absolutely amazing privilege to have been randomly, synchronistically introduced to this occult researcher, philosopher, esoteric genius. And he is guaranteed to do so with the passion that Passio can only really hit home with. Ladies and gentlemen, Mark Passio. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. That, that, that just really warms my heart. Thank you all for being here today as part of this phenomenal event. My presentation here today is entitled The Unholy Feminine, Neo-Feminism and the Satanic Epigenics Agenda. And this presentation may be difficult for many people here today to hear. Certainly will be difficult for people watching via the internet later after this conference has concluded. But nonetheless, it needs to be said. And I've kind of built my reputation sort of on the ability or the decision to come out and say some things that other people won't. And I'm gonna do that here today. Before we begin, I have a few caveats for the listening and watching audience. You won't really be seeing or hearing anything new here today. That may come as a shock to some people. You know, some people may be encountering this information for the first time, but it doesn't really mean that it's new. It's been happening. It's been ongoing. Just because it hasn't been perceived yet doesn't mean that it hasn't actually been ongoing. So nothing in this presentation is new or uniquely mine. The old saying, there is nothing new under the sun, means that truth is objective and it is eternal. And reality remains reality whether or not it is recognized and accepted as reality. All I can do in giving a presentation of this kind is put it in a personalized framework and then apply my personal aesthetics to it. If you're easily offended, it's probably a good time to get out while the getting is good. The exits are in the back, they're clearly marked. <laughs> My presentation style is off, often extremely intense and at times even combative. I don't sugarcoat my words or my delivery. Some of you are very likely during this presentation to possibly become upset and angered based on things you're gonna hear me say. So be it. Let those emotions be felt and deal with them. The truth itself by its very nature is combative because it wages war against mind control. I don't present this information to be liked. I don't present it to be popular. I don't present it to make money or to make friends. 
I speak publicly because I recognize that in a time of such overwhelming ignorance and deception, the fact that I do understand such information regarding what is taking place in our world today places me in a position of moral obligation to communicate this information to other people in an attempt to help them to understand it and to do something about it, to take action. So get as offended as you like. It's not gonna change the truth. Don't fall prey to emotional mind control. See, people make the fallacy of wanting to think with their emotions about what's true or not. It's a very slippery slope to go down. So every person who wishes to take away real value from this presentation should make a deliberate and conscious effort to do two things while watching it. You should set aside your personal perceptions of me as the presenter, a very difficult thing to do, admittedly. This includes things like you, how you think I look, dress, or sound, or my delivery style. Paying attention to such trivialities will detract your mental focus away from the information that I am presenting, and that is what is important, not me as the speaker. Be consciously aware of any impulses you may have to reject this information based solely upon your initial emotional reaction to it. It is a logical fallacy to gauge the truthfulness, the veracity of any information that you are encountering based upon how it makes you feel when you first hear it. In other words, ignore the information in this presentation today due to your own ego bullshit at your own peril because this agenda is real and happening and it affects all of us. Watch the whole thing, not in pieces. Watch the whole thing. This information is a tapestry, and in turn, it is a part of an even larger tapestry that includes all of the information that I cover as part of my work. It is meant to be taken in as a whole in its entirety. To gain maximum value from it, I recommend that you stay for the duration of both parts, tonight and tomorrow night. If you don't do that, you are most likely not to recognize the full pattern that is inherent to the tapestry that I'm trying to weave here. To gain maximum value regarding all of the information that I present, of course, visit my website, whatonearthishappening.com, and check out all of the video and all of the audio on that website. I have always been someone that has tried to listen to reason regardless of how uncomfortable it made me feel. The people that I have respected the most in life have told me hard truths that I did not want to hear and that at many times I was not prepared to hear or to listen to, but they said it anyway. Those are the kind of people that I respect and look up to. And another thing I'd just like to say is the old adage, if, it is be if I have seen further, it is because I have stood upon the shoulders of giants. I'm not the first person who has recognized this information or this agenda. I won't be the last. Uh, this is about a building on people's former work that they have taken the labor of love to put out there for others. I am not on any side except for the side of truth and freedom. This presentation isn't about taking sides. That's the side I'm on. Truth, freedom, those are my values. That's what I find important and indispensable in life. I'll take those over being liked any day. So let's get right into it. Introduction and definitions of the concepts that we'll be talking about in this presentation. This presentation is building upon my presentation from last year's Free Your Mind conference, which was called The Cult of Ultimate Evil, Order Followers, and the Destruction of the Sacred Feminine. And in that presentation, I explained how order followers in the police and the military are absolutely annihilating the dynamic of care in our society. And they are just eradicating it. And they are silencing people and stepping on their rights. And they are taking direct aim at heart-based intelligence 
and they are putting it to death. So this presentation here today, you know, of course, while last year's presentation focused largely on men, who are the vast majority of the order followers of our society. Of course, there are women order followers as well. But to be honest, they're the strong arm of the New World Order control system, the dark New World Order control system. Uh, let's, let's be honest, that the, the order followers who are implementing that s slavery system are largely comprised of men, military and police, who actually do the violent behaviors that they're ordered to do. This year, I'm shifting the focus and I'm talking about the destruction of the sacred feminine specifically within women, within females in our society. And this is no less deadly to the dynamic of care in our society, which could act as the creative and cohesive glue between people that helps them to awaken and to change the world for the better. Unfortunately, this agenda I'm going to be talking about is shutting down the dynamic of care in many women. I call this agenda, the, the neo-feminism agenda, the elephant in the room. It's, it's so big and it's actually so obvious that it acts like this old adage, there's an elephant in the room and nobody notices. And it's because a lot of people don't want to hear this. They don't want to talk about it. It's uncomfortable information. It's information that people really cringe at bringing it up because of how touchy some of the topics in this are. Uh, you know, this quote here, it's funny how everybody considers honesty a virtue and yet no one wants to hear the truth. It's very difficult to hear painful truths, especially if they may apply somewhat in some ways to you yourself. This is a great quote, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read or write, but those who cannot unlearn the many lies that they have been conditioned to believe and seek out the hidden knowledge that they have been conditioned to reject. I would add to that and say, it's the hidden knowledge that they have been conditioned by mind control to ignore. This information that I'm presenting here today isn't so much occulted. It is ignored because bringing it up to people can create very uncomfortable social situations for the person bringing it up. And that's why it remains largely unspoken. The information I'm gonna be presenting is controversial. But what does the word controversial mean etymologically? The word controversial comes from the Latin adverb contra, meaning facing, face to face or up against and the Latin verb versare, which means to change or to alter. So when we put those together, the word controversial, literally in its root meaning, its root origin, means coming face to face with change, having to deal or having to confront the prospect of changing yourself. That's why things are often controversial. You cannot change what you refuse to confront. You will never create lasting positive change by running away or not facing something that needs to be faced and dealt with. I would not be willing to potentially alienate a significantly large portion of my entire listening audience by talking about this topic, this controversial topic of neo-feminism, if it were not real and critically important for us to understand. I am the furthest thing from a misogynist, and anyone who knows me personally will testify to that fact. I do not have hatred in my heart toward women. I will not make blanket statements here today in this presentation about, quote, all women. I will, however, during this presentation, be speaking in generalizations about most women or the vast majority of women. And here's a very important point to really take note of. It will be very important to note that even when I do use the term women in this presentation, I am referring to what I call the inauthentic woman or the conditioned woman or the mind controlled woman or the socially engineered woman. And when I say men, I'm also largely referring to the inauthentic man the socially 
conditioned man, the socially engineered man. And these are concepts that I will explore later in the presentation, the inauthentic woman and the inauthentic man. So just keep that in mind. All feminism is not equal. There is a world of division, a world divide, a world of separation between classical feminism and what I term neo-feminism. Now, other people have used the term neo-feminism, okay? And I want to just say, I am using neo-feminism in a specific context here today, which I'm going to talk about and define. You know, these are two images that I think clearly depict the difference between what classical feminism represented, okay, votes for women, uh, and you know, that's misguided in its own way because you're picking your, your master or enslaver, but that's another, you know, that's another discussion. But, um, you know, and, and neo-feminism, which, you know, here's, here's a woman screaming into the camera set with the words, fuck your morals, printed on her chest, written on her chest, okay? You know, uh, you could clearly see the difference in consciousness between these, you know, types of individuals. So classical feminism had certain basic points that it, it desired for women. It wanted equality for both genders in natural human rights. And this, of course, is in keeping with natural law. Everyone, regardless of gender, race, color, ostensible religion, whatever, has exactly the same natural rights. No one has any more or less rights than anybody else under natural law. So, of course, everyone should be equal in, in natural human rights. I mean, this goes without saying. So in that sense, I agree with the, the principles of classical feminism. Women should receive the same pay in the same job for the same work that they perform. Well, who shouldn't? Why should anybody discriminate with pay for work that is being done? If it's the same job and you're producing the same end result, of course you should be compensated similarly. Uh, there shouldn't be discrimination in that respect. I can get behind that concept. Uh, classical feminism believed that you know, the gender should be equal in their rights and there should be no patriarchy or matriarchy in society. Men shouldn't be in control and dominate women and women shouldn't be in control and dominate men. They wanted cooperation between the genders. Again, another concept I could get behind completely. So in that sense, I could consider myself a classical feminist. I have no problem with any of those concepts. Now, neo-feminism, on the other hand, took things into a very skewed extremist mindset. It wants in many ways, additional, quote, rights for women over men in today's contemporary society, which I cannot agree with or get behind because there are no special rights that any individual has over any other. We all have exactly the same natural rights. Neo-feminism often attempts to equate the genders in all aspects, in characteristics, capabilities, etc. Not just natural human rights. You know, being equal in rights doesn't mean we're the same and can all do the same things, okay? We all are unique individuals with, with different unique characteristics. So it's not about sameness. It, it should be about equality under rights, but not trying to equate everyone exactly identically and make them all the same. And neo-feminists, many of them, believe that matriarchy should replace the idea that they have in their mind that there is a currently entrenched patriarchy in our society and I will address the fact that that is a myth, an illusion, and we don't have either one of those dynamics in our society today. This is what classical feminism looks like if I could give it an image, you know. And that's what neo-feminism looks like if I could give it an image in, in your mind. And I wholeheartedly agree with the one on the left there, and you know, the one on the right, I think it takes things to a ridiculous extreme. Neo-feminism, ladies and gentlemen, is an act of war. It is a program of social engineering or mind control, which is spe specifically targeted at women in order to incite a war between the sexes in a divide and conquer strategy. The long-term goal of this manipulated war is to weaken both genders to such an extent that it becomes much easier for the entrenched ruling class to subjugate both men and women under their worldwide system of totalitarian control that they are currently well on their way to building and completing. They are waging a gender war against both men and women through the neo-feminist agenda. 
Why do this? Why a gender war? Lots of reasons. Most people are completely ignorant to the fact that the ongoing and largely undeclared gender war is actually an occult eugenics agenda. My intention in presenting this information is not to further divide the sexes, but to illustrate and expose this eugenics agenda, which is being implemented by dark occultists who, who seek to subvert the true natural order and replace that natural order with their twisted and depraved religion of slavery and death. The gender war is what is known as a dialectic manipulation. This is a divide and conquer mind control strategy that is employed by social engineers and mind controllers. So what is dialectics? What does dialectic mean? The word dialectic is derived from the Greek preposition dia, meaning through or by way of, by means of, and the Latin noun lectus, which means choice. So literally, dialectics is a methodology of control that works through choice by way of some people on one side of a divide taking a side and making a choice and, fought, and then taking action based on that and people on the other side of the issue or the divide making a choice and then acting upon that choice. It's like the political party system that we have in the United States and many other so-called free countries. It's really a one-party system, but they're giving you the illusion that it's a two-party system and they're ultimately taking you uh, taking everyone to the slaughterhouse regardless of which party they choose. So the dialectic in neo-feminism is largely between people who believe that there's a patriarchy and people who believe that there should be a matriarchy. And, you know, if you look at the words, what do they have in common? Archy, meaning rulership, control over other people, or in other words, slavery, from the Greek archon, which means master over a slave. You know, the other commonality here is uh, the control system itself, you know, to use a Game of Thrones analogy here. Great show, by the way. <laughs> um, you know, it doesn't matter who's sitting on that throne. The concept to keep in mind here is there's a throne to be sat upon, which needs to be destroyed and eradicated. And we need the concept of authority needs to, to go in our society. I always give this analogy to the situation. You know, people, uh, a lot of you know, alternative historians and researchers want to say, well, war, World War II was a big manipulated war. Yes, it was. Of course international bankers were involved in manipulating both sides. But here's the thing. Who did they really manipulate first? They manipulated the Axis powers and specifically the Nazis, got them all whipped into a religious fervor to wage war on the large portion of the European continent. So the question becomes, well, you know, how long do we let this manipulate, manipulated dialect go on for? You could make the claim, oh, well, they were all manipulated and under mind control, under a religious form of mind control called Nazism. Well, does that change the difference in what they were actually getting done through their actions? You know, if somebody is performing great violence upon other people, do you say, oh my God, they're under mind control. I realize that they're totally, they're, they're falling for a dialectic manipulation and they're completely uh, ma manipulated and under mind control. So does that mean you just let their actions go on unchecked? You know, it's like the, it's like the current police state that we're dealing with in America. Well, everybody says, well, the police are just under mind control. They think what they're doing is right. They think they're just doing their jobs. Well, does that mean you just let them continue to stomp all over your rights for eternity? You know? And because you realize that they happen to be manipulated and under mind control, well, no action should be taken. Well, you're just going to let them do it. See, the concept to keep in mind here is both sides don't have to fall for the manipulation. Only one side of a dialectic needs to fall for the manipulation in order for the dialectic manipulation to be, be successful. Because they're... They believe in their minds that they have an enemy and they're waging war on that enemy already. So once one side buys into the dialectic, it's on. The war is on. And the other side has one of two choices. They either have to convince the other side that they're under complete mind control and manipulation, and that other side has to be willing to listen to reason and change their behavior as a result, or 
There has to be a conflict. There has to be a choice that is made. People can be pulled into a dialectic legitimately. You know, I'll take fighting a war against people who are waging a war on freedom. Even if I know they're under mind control, doesn't matter. The end result is the same if freedom's going to die. The end result is the same if freedom's going to die. You know, so it doesn't make a difference if somebody has bought the manipulation. That doesn't excuse the behavior and mean that no, no action should be taken regarding it. So keep that in mind. That's how this gender war is being played off. And I'm not taking sides, but I am saying one of the sides is deeply buying into this gender war manipulation. And now they're getting the opposite effect in place where men are responding to that in very reactive ways, which I'm going to talk about tomorrow. There is no bigger dialectic breakdown. There's no bigger dialectic divide than men versus women. There's no big, religion isn't a bigger divide. There's lots more religions. And it's, it's a, a skewed percentage. It's not a 50-50 percentage, you know? Um, political divides, you know? There's one party, another party, and there's people who don't buy into either, and then there's people who uh, follow, uh, you know, independent candidates, et cetera. There, that's not a 50-50 divide. There is no divide in humanity that is exactly 50-50. And the social engineers know that. That's why they specifically focused their efforts on cultivating this gender war, because it's the only place where this 50-50 divide exists. And through it, they can create maximum social tension, because the fabric of a society is the familial bond between man and woman. Make no mistake about that. That's why they're trying to wage this gender war, to create maximum divide and maximum social tension, instability, and chaos amongst people. This presentation is ultimately solution-oriented, and the solutions will be talked about tomorrow night. It is not presented to incite a further divide between men and women, as I've already said, but to promote awareness of the manipulation tactics being employed against both genders. The final part of this presentation will focus upon solutions that we can implement to heal the divide between the genders and to promote unified relationships. The neo-feminism agenda and the gender war that it is waging is a form of eugenics. Now, I know most of the people in this room know about eugenics, but a lot of the people that perhaps are listening to this information for the first time don't know about eugenics or what it is. The word eugenics is derived from the Greek adjective eugenes, meaning well-born, which is in turn derived from the Greek adjective eu, meaning good, and the Greek noun genos, meaning race or stock. Eugenics is a social ideology advocating the promotion of higher rates of sexual reproduction for people with traits and characteristics desired by its proponents, and reduced rates of sexual reproduction and sterilization for those with undesired traits and characteristics. This practice could be described as a main religious tenet of the ruling class who believe that it is simply the quote unquote natural order for the most ruthless of humans whose genes in their minds are the quote fittest to rule the rest of the human herd. They see themselves as a quote elite class of human beings who attained the highest positions of power in the world because they are genetically superior to those they rule over. Ultimately, this psychopathic ruling class believe that they have every right to decide who is allowed to live and procreate and who must die. You know, we've seen this ideology propagated in, in the past through wars and political agendas that really are an agenda of religious fervor, if you look much deeper into it. And what ultimately the religion that underlies eugenics is, is Satanism. The biggest form of eugenics that has, is being waged upon the human population right now, aside from the neo-feminism agenda, is abortion. I mean, it's, it's such a hardcore war that's being waged, especially against minority populations. I mean, over half 
of the African American population's pregnancies in the United States end in abortion. More babies are being aborted than born. Operations like Planned Parenthood are directly involved in eugenics. And many of the people involved in, in the boards of organizations like that make no bones about it, that they are eugenicists and they think the population needs to be culled. The dark occultists of this world are practically coming out in the open and telling people that they want to call them. You know, building monuments to eugenics, as the Georgia Guidestones are. Right on the stones, it says, maintain humanity under 500 million in what they think of as perpetual balance with nature. Now, that's perpetual balance with a satanic mindset that there's an elite class that can consider themselves God on earth. That's what that is. That's an elimination of over 95% of the human population. And believe me, if they could get that done today, they would do it. And they're working toward it. I wanna talk a little bit about something that Jay Parker talked about, which is epigenetics. And there's a lot of researchers that if you guys don't know about, I'm sure people in this room do, but a lot of people listening at home, they, they need to do the work and do the research and look into this topic because it's not only fascinating, it's critical to understand. The word epigenetics is derived from the Greek prefix epi, meaning beyond, further than, or past, and the Latin verb genere, which means to make or to create. So you put them together and it means beyond the genes, beyond cre the creative aspect. It's that which goes beyond our genes. Epigenetics is an emerging branch of science that takes human consciousness into direct consideration regarding the biological, psychological, and physiological expressions of human life and human society. The science of epigenetics clearly demonstrates that human beings possess the ability to create adaptive changes to their gene expressions via changes in consciousness. Genes have been proven to be only a tendency for biological expression. Since consciousness precedes the genetic expression in the physical domain, if consciousness is changed, then the gene expression in the physical domain can be fundamentally altered. In other words, can we actually alter our gene, genes and our genetic code through an alteration in our consciousness? And the answer is yes. This has been proven by this new emerging science. You know, I thought the word epigenetics had actually been scrubbed by mainstream media, but I shocked myself in doing some of the research for this presentation because I found that Time Magazine, of all publications, actually did a front story a front uh, story piece on epigenetics in January of 2010. Epigenetics has shown that human beings are not controlled by genes like computer programs are controlled by computer code. This is a fallacy that is propagated by Darwinian scientism and the whole theory of evolution of the survival of the fittest or the most ruthless for almost two centuries. When we work to change our consciousness and our beliefs, our biological and psychological code can actually be rewritten and a different expression can be manifested. In other words, we are not our genetic code. That is not who we are. We are the writers of our genetic code. We are the authors of our genes and they can be re-expressed if we re-express our consciousness. If fully grasped by humanity, this fundamental understanding could help us to radically transform our world for the better. And here are th just three, there's many others, but just three researchers who I feel take this science and put it into very easily understood terms that the, the layman, the non-scientist, can really deeply understand. And that is Dr. Bruce Lipton, who wrote the book, The Biology of Belief. Dr. Joe Dispenza, who wrote the book, Breaking the Habit of Healing Yourself. And Greg Braden, who wrote The Spontaneous Healing of Belief, among many others. 
I highly suggest the work. Now, let me qualify this as well. There's going to be some other researchers that I'll talk about tomorrow that, you know, I don't have to agree with everything these guys think or talk about. I can put you onto some information that you have to be discerning about. You have to look at what is true and good and needs to be further explored in their research. And if they talk about some things that you don't fully agree with, well, then you have to use your own judgment and discernment. You have to let that go and weed it out the inconsistencies. But I'm telling you, their work on epigenetics is brilliant and it needs to be understood by humanity. Epigenetic eugenics. Okay, so now we're taking eugenics, the control over the population, into the epigenetic domain. Follow me here, okay? This is eugenics that is waged through the manipulation of consciousness. That is possible. It's not only possible, it's being done. What if an occult ruling class long ago discovered how to influence the breeding process within entire populations for the purpose of making those populations easier for them to control. In other words, controlling human breeding by manipulating human consciousness to get the characteristics of the next generation to come out the way the ruling class wants those characteristics to come out. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, human farming. Because that is what the control class, the social engineer class consider themselves. They consider themselves farmers of the human herd of cattle. That's how they view us. That's how they view you. This is Population control through mind control. Population control waged through mind control. That's when we take the sugar coating off and call it what it really is. I have truncated or shortened these terms. Instead of calling it epigenetic eugenics, I refer to it as epigenetics. It's taking eugenics to the next level. Going beyond is what epi means when we put it in front as a prefix on a word. So we're going beyond classical physical eugenics that involve force, direct violence, and sterilization of human beings, okay? Now we're taking it into the epigenetic realm, the realm of consciousness and the realm of mind control and manipulation. Epi-eugenics is the propagation of eugenics by way of social engineering or mind control and selective breeding by the very population which the eugenics strategy is targeted to destroy. The people who the eugenics strategy is targeted to wean or to cull is actually performing this very selective breeding process. And they have been convinced that it is actually in their best interest to perform that calling upon themselves. And that's what's happening in our society, folks. That is going on actively as we're sitting here. Eugenics, epi-eugenics, one could call it mind-controlled downbreeding. Mind-controlled downbreeding. Or in other words, getting the human herd to call itself. That's what the social engineers of our world have actually accomplished, and I'm gonna explain how it works. It is very important to understand that eugenics is not just about population reduction. It is ultimately about controlling which characteristics are expressed in human society. By breeding certain desired characteristics into the gene pool, and breeding certain undesirable characteristics out of the gene pool. That's how eugenics is performed, okay? It's not just about killing off a bunch of people. It's if you want a society to go in a certain direction and you want certain characteristics in the members of that society, you have to influence the breeding of those characteristics and you have to influence the outbreeding of the characteristics you no longer want in it. 
The social engineers of our society, however, ladies and gentlemen, this may come as a big shock to you, are not actually eug eugenicists. They are not actually performing eugenics, okay? They are actually performing dysgenics. See, we shouldn't even be using the word eugenics to describe this process because it means good breeding. It means breeding strength into a society. It means upbreeding, making a society more strong and more cohesive and more dynamic and more diverse and just higher in consciousness in general than it used to be. That's not what the social engineers are trying to do. They're doing that to themselves, to their own subclass. Oh yeah, they're eugenicists for themselves, but not for us. You know, they're, they are waging a war of dysgenics, if the truth be told. They're creating people with horrible traits and characteristics through the manipulation of human biology and consciousness via chemicals in our food, water, and air, in addition to radionics fields that interfere with and change human physiology for the worse. I know Jay also discussed that in a big way yesterday as well. Our work overlaps a lot in this regard. Instead of eugenics and epi-eugenics, it would actually be much more accurate to refer to the strategies that I'm talking about of these social engineers as dysgenics and epidysgenics, respectively. Since these tactics are being used to weaken and destroy target populations instead of improving upon them. So really what we have is neo-feminism and the satanic epidysgenics agenda. That's what's really being waged against us. So that calls to question, when I say satanic epigenics or epidysgenics agenda, what are we talking about? What is Satanism? Now I know the people in this room from my work know what Satanism really is, but the vast majority of the human population still has absolutely zero idea what Satanism really is. They have an idea in their own mind of what they think it is, but the idea that's floating around in their own mind has nothing whatsoever to do what Satanism really is. And there are still people who want to tell me I'm not accurate about this and I don't know what Satanism is when I was a priest in this religion for almost a decade of my life. That's like walking up to a Catholic priest and saying, you know nothing about Catholicism. You went to seminary school. You're actually in the priest class of this religion. You know absolutely nothing about what it teaches or what's going on. You know, you would think you'd go up to somebody who is a clergy member of a particular religion if you wanted some information regarding the tenets or beliefs or practices of, of that religion, wouldn't you? You know, I was a clergy member of this religion, but I have no idea what it really is. You know? Satanism actually is an ancient occult religion comprised of diverse interconnected networks of worldwide adherence. At its ideological core, this religion postulates that knowledge of the human psyche and knowledge of the laws of the universe should be occulted and held only by a few human beings. It is much more accurate to perceive Satanists and dark occultists in general as ancient psychologists who hold and wield hidden information for the purpose of exploiting those who continue to remain ignorant of it. Through the power differential that this subclass of humanity gains by way of manipulating those who remain in ignorance of this occulted knowledge, this small minority who are in the know wish to permanently rule the masses of humanity and effectively become God on earth. It is important to understand that contrary to popular belief, the overwhelmingly vast majority of real Satanists do not worship an externalized deity known as Satan in the Christian tradition, but instead see Satanism as an ideological way of being in the world and view the ego-driven self as the quote-unquote God of their religion. They view themselves as God, folks. They're not worshiping any external deity. They're worshiping themselves, if you want to even word it that way. They're propping themselves up as God. That's what they want to be. They want to rule in a prison on a prison planet as the gods of that planet. That's what Satanism is. The symbolism and trappings of the Christian devil or Satan are used in modern Satanism for two main reasons. 
The first of these reasons is to try to make outsiders who know nothing about what Satanism really is see Satanism as, quote, just another quaint religious belief that is based upon traditional Christian belief systems, which it absolutely has nothing to do with. The second reason for these trappings of the Christian devil uh, is to associate itself with the adversarial dynamic in nature, because that's what the word Satan means, as we'll see. Now, this adversarial dynamic in nature is referred to as involution in the occult world because it counters the force which drives consciousness forward, which is true evolution. The word Satan comes from the Hebrew word shatan, meaning adversary or opposer. Satanism is ultimately about being opposed to the true order of natural law, the universal laws of morality, which govern the behavioral consequences of beings who are gifted with the capacity for holistic intelligence and free will. They want to turn that natural law order on its head. So, the bulk of the entire presentation over the next two days is going to be what I call the war against the goddess. Or, what modern women are being socially engineered to think, to want, and to be, and the effects of that social engineering upon human society. Now, I will be giving this entire section, the war against the goddess, little over half of it today until the end of the presentation, and then the remainder I will pick up with tomorrow night, and then solutions will be presented at the end of the presentation tomorrow evening. Why specifically target women? Here's the main reasons that eugenicists and social engineers specifically have crafted these forms of mind control to target women in particular. Since women possess the capability of influencing men, and that is true. Most women, uh, I'm sorry, most men will adjust their attitudes and behaviors to conform to women's likes and preferences. And the people sitting in this room here today know that that statement is true. And most people out, out there in the listening audience on the internet will recognize that statement as being valid. Therefore, if the ruling class can influence the minds of most women, the men and children of a society will ultimately follow. And folks, every totalitarian regime has known that truth and has adapted those principles to its twisted, twisted advantage. Additionally, women ultimately control, at a biological level, the human procreation process by way of their control over the selection of males with whom they choose to reproduce. Taking both of these factors into consideration, it is women who ultimately decide which traits and characteristics will be passed down to future generations of humanity. Now, that's not taking epigenetics into account, but just genetically. Now, then you add all the epigenetic stuff, and if you have women under that epigenetic form of mind control, the manipulation of their consciousness, you're going to absolutely influence the characteristics that are going to be expressed at an epigenetic level as well. My question to everyone here in the listening audience today is, are your quote-unquote likes truly your own? A very uncomfortable question to ask. What qualities do you find attractive in another person? Is it possible that such likes and preferences could be implanted into your belief system? It might surprise and even disturb most people to think that such aspects of their personality may not actually be their own. Most people don't even truly know why they find certain things attractive and others not. The same can be said for both men and women. Is all such attraction just a natural instinctive, instinctual dynamic? Or can a great portion of that kind of attraction be attributed to cultural programming? And I would suggest most certainly it is the latter. There's a lot of cultural programming and engineering that goes into manipulating people's perceptions of what they find attractive or not. Edward Bernays, one of the leading social engineers of the last century, absolute Satanist, involved in the Tavistock Institute of Human Relations, Chatham House, Wellington House, involved with Walter Lippmann, another huge eugenicist, 
you know, radically transformed for the worse modern Western society, this mind controller and eugenicist. He said this, the conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism, this occulted mechanism of society, constitute an invisible government, in other words, a ruling class, which is the true ruling power of our country. We are governed, our minds are molded, our tastes formed, our ideas suggested, largely by men we have never heard of. This is a logical result of the way in which our democratic society is organized. And folks, he's not talking about the American so-called democratic society. He's talking about that's a logical progression of the way that the sick, twisted, social engineer, control freak ruling class is organized. And they're putting their religion into practice, which is eugenics. The inauthentic woman, this is very critical to keep in mind, this is what I'm talking about when I refer to women throughout this presentation. The inauthentic woman, or the socially engineered woman, is being, above all else, culturally conditioned to no longer be attracted to any of the qualities of an authentic man. Let me repeat that. The inauthentic woman is being conditioned in this Epi eugenics mind control agenda to not be attracted to the qualities of what I refer to in this presentation as a genuine man, an awake man, that's, that's the spiritual alpha, as I'm going to refer to it later in the presentation. Such qualities of the genuine man include high holistic intelligence, not just intellect, true confidence and high self esteem being very vocally opinionated, having very masculine features and an overall masculine look, independence, a rebellious attitude toward authority, and placing very high value on individual freedom. Such traits are, of course, and I would suggest that represents most of the males, the men in this room, genuine men, genuine, authentic men. However, of course, such traits are seen as highly dangerous to the goals of the ruling class, who wish especially to see society produce weakened men, since weakened, emasculated men, quote unquote men, are very unlikely to resist the state, while strong, independent thinking men are more likely to resist the control of the state. That's why they want to breed these qualities out of the human male. And that's why they want women specifically not to find those qualities attractive in a potential partner. When I say the authentic or the inauthentic man or woman, what am I talking about? So I've made this real simple breakdown chart of what I consider the authentic being versus the inauthentic being. The, all of the things that are listed in red are what I consider the inauthentic human, or what we can consider the beta class of humanity, which is the bulk of humanity. The bulk of humanity fits into those red squares, okay? Then there's the true alpha class of human beings, of male and female, okay? This is what I call the spiritually awake, the spiritual alpha female, the spiritual alpha male. So let's look at some of the qualities of these types of men and women. The beta female, and again, I put female in quotes here. It's not the genuine female. They are conditioned to submit to the dominator type so-called alpha males. Again, alpha is in quotes and male is in quotes because they're not the alpha and they're not true men. And we'll look at their characteristics, okay, in a moment. The, the alpha female is conditioned to desire either the dominator type alpha male or to control the submissive beta male who wants to be controlled by them. 
the beta male is conditioned to submit to the dominator type alpha female. The alpha male, so-called alpha male, okay, the non-genuine or inauthentic male, is conditioned to either desire the dominator type alpha female or to control the submissive beta female. Okay, so you see that the alpha male can basically cross over with the alpha female or the beta female. The alpha female can cross over with the beta uh, male or the alpha male. The all inauthentic types of human beings because they're all under mind control. And what is the next commonality? What are they all playing a game of? Control. control. Either to be controlled or to control someone else. They're in that mindset where they desire to be controlled, or they desire to be in control of someone else. That's the quality that makes someone inherently inauthentic. The genuine woman, or the spiritual alpha female, the true female, the true alpha female, is free of social engineering conditioning and does not play that control game, as does the genuine man or the spiritual alpha male. They're free of that social conditioning, and they don't play the game of either wanting to control someone else or wanting to be controlled by someone else. Let's look at some of these programming tactics that are used against women. This is one I think just about everybody can see very openly because it's so blatant and will agree with. The inauthentic, it's called princess programming that they start very early. They have to start with very, very, very young women when they're children. The inauthentic woman has been socially engineered from a very young age to want to be placated, revered, and pampered. Princess programming is huge in Western culture and starts at a very early age. Through this programming, young women are often taught, here's the list of things they're taught to do and to be like to value only what can be gained for themselves through relationships with men, to seek only men who can quote unquote provide for them or quote unquote take care of them, and to quote marry well, to marry into money, etc. To place paramount importance on their own physical appearance to quote lure a male to devalue the importance of their own intelligence, to seek money as their main value system, and even to think that, quote unquote, no man is good enough for them. You'd be surprised how many people teach this kind of a value system to their daughters. It is going on continually in our society. Very powerful form of mind control. You know, that parents are actually propagating unknowingly. And they're doing it through the mass media and, and movies that project these values right into the subconscious mind of children as well. The primary motivational factor that women are taught to desire through this social engineering is security. This is the psychological dynamic that they are taught to crave from the minute they are out of the womb, practically, by the ruling class. The inauthentic woman is largely motivated by the psychological desire for attachment and security. To them, again, the inauthentic, socially engineered woman, love is seen as pr primarily as a form of permanence and attachment rather than a deep familial bond with another human being. Money and government are often perceived by them as assurances of comfort, prosperity, and long-term security. Again, this is a fear response. This is a fear tactic of manipulation based on scarcity mind control, scarcity-based mind control. The primary desire for financial security as a resource for safety can be most readily seen in our culture in the most frequently asked question by a woman to a man when first meeting, which is, what do you do for a living? I have now, independently as a social experiment, asked 
107 people this question. 107 people have answered the question the same way. The first, I asked, what is the first question after initial pleasantries are exchanged? That inevitably, invariably, a woman in our society will ask a, a, a man during their first encounter when they're first meeting. 107 out of 107 human beings immediately, like that, spit back the answer, what do you do for a living? Ladies and gentlemen, if I stood on the street corner outside this hotel tomorrow morning and asked 107 people on a cloudless, sunny day in an area of the sky where the sun is not shining, just if you look in the sky, what color does it refract? They would not answer blue. 107 people would not give the answer blue to that question. And I'm serious. You cannot get social agreement on a question, on any question that perfectly aligned on any topic. But that one you can. Why is that? It has nothing to do with mind control. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Ultimately, the desire for security is the desire for an illusion. There is no such thing as security, ladies and gentlemen. Doesn't exist now, never has existed, is never going to exist. A comet could be on the way to hit this planet in the next couple of days, and our ass would be grass. <laughs> and there wouldn't be a damn thing anybody would be able to do about it. You think you're secure on a planet, a physical planet, in, in a solar system going around a star? There's no security here. A cataclysm could happen any day. Ask people in, you know, southeastern Asia how secure they feel when an earthquake could hit the middle of, of the Pacific or the Indian Ocean at any time and create a massive tsunami. There's no security on this planet. There's no safety here. If you're ex expecting safety, living for safety, living se for security, you're already under mind control. You're already living in a dynamic of fear. As long as you live in a physical reality, there is danger. And it has to be embraced and accepted. You cannot live life in fear. The search for security in a man with money or the desire to be simply, quote, taken care of by someone else is an integral part of the ego gratification, me, 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 satanic mindset. Very few want to see and admit the truth regarding this. Most will attribute this to Darwinian theory biological response, you know, this desire for security in a male. You know, trying to find the, the most fittest to propagate the genes to the next level. This is a whole so social Darwinism and, and physical Darwinism argument. When in fact this behavior is deeply ingrained social conditioning. Sadly, most people desire a state of safe and secure slavery as opposed to one of dangerous freedom and its associated personal responsibility. I'm not interested in safety, folks. I'm interested in freedom. I'm interested in my natural rights as a sovereign being. Most men are also in this manipulated mindset, unfortunately. The realization that death lurks around every corner is the state of reality that the authentic man and the authentic woman live in at all times. And they embrace that. They know that no one knows when it's their time. You don't live your life thinking about that. You live your life focused on what you want to do and trying to do the right thing and trying to build, build yourself up and help to build others up. If you live like that, you're living an authentic life. The mind control program attempts to get the inauthentic woman to equate money with genuine value to have money as the principal basis of their value system. The inauthentic woman is socially engineered to perceive money as the primary value system in human life. This general mindset postulates that something is only worth doing if money is being made by doing it. In reality, nothing could be further from truth. 
This is one of the primary reasons that art, music, poetry, and especially philosophy are so drastically de-emphasized in modern society and even frowned upon by many people as something that you choose to do only if you quote unquote want to starve, you know? How many people take that mindset? They think the only value in anything is if money could be acquired by doing it. This leads to the concept in neo-feminism known as hypergamy, which means marrying well or marrying up, marrying the man with the most resources, the biggest bank account, the most comfortable lifestyle. When the inauthentic woman meets a man for the first time, the first and foremost question that she asks is, what do you do for a living? Why is it not, do you know the difference between right and wrong behavior? Can anybody answer that question? I'd like an answer to it personally. That should be the first question a human being asked to another person they're meeting for the first time. Do you know the difference between right and wrong? That's what I'm concerned about. That's what I wanna make sure you have a deep, full, fundamental grasp of when I'm building a relationship with you. I'm not interested in what you do to make fake ass Federal Reserve notes that aren't worth the paper they're printed on. No, but I have friends, I don't know what they do for a job. I honestly have friends, I don't know what they do for a job. And I don't care, and I don't even need to ask them that question. As long as they're not doing something completely immoral that's coercive toward other people's rights, I don't care. Hypergamy, or marrying upward, is a learned behavior, a socially engineered behavior that is entirely about the search for security in a man with a high monetary income. You know, some of these images here could be a little incendiary or inflammatory. Hey, so be it. This is going on out there in society. The, the image to the uh, left, to the bottom left says, if we're going to date, I need to know your credit score, how much money you have in the bank, and if you're vaccinated. <laughs> Meanwhile, notice this guy is a complete psychopath with a big knife behind his back. You know, she's not interested in, you know, whether he's a good guy. She wants to know all this other stuff about his, you know, his finance. The one on the bottom right says, this guy wins $181 million in the lottery on Wednesday and then finds the love of his life just two days later. Talk about luck. <laughs> you know, I mean, get as offended as you like, folks. Stuff like that goes on all the time in our society, all the time. Here's a video that kind of describes what her hypergamy is. I got a kick out of this one, but I'll tell you what, it's more prevalent, it's more out there than anyone would be comfortable believing. Let's watch this. Hey, what's up? Hi. You're pretty cute. Uh, wanna hang out sometime? I uh, don't know, yeah. I'm here. I'm just new here, so I just wanna see, you know, okay. chill, hang out or something. You do? Yeah. I mean, we can just be friends, you know, it doesn't have to go. Uh, it's kind of serious, though. It's a good idea. Nothing? I'll give my number out to people I don't know, sorry. Sure? Yeah. All right, well. Bye. We got a million dollar deal going on on Thursday. We can't screw this up. Trust me. Yeah, no, it's a simple. About 48 million we're looking at. All right, let me call you back. All right, bye. Hi, how's it going? Hi, good. Are you, um, are you sitting here alone? Yeah, I am. Mind if I join you? Yeah, I don't know. You don't have to have a boyfriend or anything waiting for me, do you? What do you got going on later on tonight? I'm not doing anything. What are you up to? Um, nothing. It's my, I don't have any plans tonight. I was wondering maybe you wanted to get a drink. Yeah, that sounds good. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, why don't we, oh, actually, um, I'm here meeting up with my boss. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm going to give him this car. You my car? Here you go, boss. I'll wash your car. You my jacket? Got your jacket in the car. Get on the jacket. All right. Would you like me to clean? Yeah. Why? I don't know. Why does it matter? Oh, it doesn't matter. 
So you still want to grab a drink or? Wait, so do you have a boyfriend or you don't? No, it's not that serious. I guess we could hang out maybe like 10, 15 minutes ago. Yeah, you want to <laughs> But I hate liars and gold diggers. <laughs> You know, I mean, this legitimately does go on. I wish it weren't so. You know, I, look, I, I wish a lot of what I'm talking about here in this presentation weren't so. I don't want it to be this way, you know? When I talk about this with people, even in my personal life, it's like, it's, they don't even respond with, with hatred to what's going on. They respond with disappointment. That's really the dynamic that I feel. That's the, that's, the, that's the energy that I feel when I think about this type of stuff. Because I realize what the true potential could be for our species versus what we're really doing and the kind of values that we're really holding. And um, you know, I, get, I get disappointed about it. The rampant consumerism that is taught to the inauthentic woman. The inauthentic women largely drive the world's corporate economy being responsible for over 85% of total purchases of all goods and services according to corporate and consumer advocacy studies. This is not only well past the natural expected median, but it is ridiculously skewed. I mean, you would think that, you know, men and women basically, you know, use equal amounts of resources. And so, you know, you would pr pretty much see a 50-50 median distribution distributed on a, a dynamic like that, but you don't. 85 to 15, I mean, that's unnaturally skewed. This is not only well past the natural expected median, but it's ridiculously skewed, and it shows just how much corporate advertising is completely geared toward the manipulation of women. It also shows their purchasing power and their power to influence entire societal trends. I would say for the worse, or if they choose to step into their true power, they can influence things for the better society. Yeah. Equality versus sameness. The neo-feminist agenda continually reinforces the notion that women are the same as men, not just having equal rights as men, but the same in characteristics and abilities as well. This was one of the main techniques used to influence women to join the corporate workforce, which removed them from their traditional roles as nurturers of the young. Children were then largely turned over to state-run indoctrination, the state-run indoctrination system of public schooling, in order to shape their beliefs and destroy their health and morals. Abandonment issues were also created when children were put into public schooling through parents being absent, both parents in the workforce being absent from the, the children during the 15,000 hours of compulsory schooling that children are made to endure in Western culture. You know, the, the state ends up being the nanny or the mother figure or the father figure, you know, because of this. It's, it's a, a side effect, you know, of the whole agenda to bring women into the working, corporate working world. Not to say that you know, women shouldn't have careers. I'm just saying there was an alternative agenda. There was an alternative motive at work when this was done. Beyond the conditioned woman is being socially engineered to love the state. This is what I call the unholy matrimony between women and governments. They're being engineered to love the state for the small, tiny perks that they are given by it. On a subconscious level, they've bought into the state as a protective father figure. And this itself is an expression of a parental abandonment issue or perhaps not having a strong father figure during their formative years. Emotional, spiritual, and sexual connections between men and women are being eroded and may be eventually eradicated by the state. The state continually positions itself to be psychologically accepted especially by the inauthentic woman, as the provider, the protector, 
and the husband. The vast majority of women in our society, unfortunately, will not speak out against the state for these very reasons. And ladies and gentlemen, I just have to be honest myself. I mean, when I look at political rallies, it is so skewed. It's nowhere near a 50-50 distribution in mainstream politics where people are trying to vote for a master. I mean, it's like over 75, 20, it's over three quarters to one quarter female to male distribution, at least, just by my own cursory um, you know, assessment of, of the, the, the numbers involved. Why would so many women be directly involved in the, the process, the governmental process to pick a new slave master? You know, it, it, it's, it's, it's a sad thing, but I have to point it out. You know, just like the, the, the numbers in a place like this are pretty equal, very equal, just looking at the audience, you know? Um, because these are, we're highly conscious people who are aware of a lot of these agendas. But I mean, in general, in the movement to just even have less government in our lives, again, it's a very skewed thing where it's largely men, and I would say it's a probably an eight or nine to one ratio in what I would call the freedom movement or what I would personally call the my freedom movement, as I talk about. I don't think we have a true freedom movement built yet. I think this is a start of one here at the Free Your Mind conferences and events. But um, I think people you know, who want less government want it, want it that way for largely selfish reasons still. And they're not thinking about it from a very philosophical and moral level as such yet. It's slowly building to get into those philosophical principles, but I think it has a long way to go. But even within that movement, like it's a ridiculously skewed ratio. And you, you would hope to see a more even gender distribution, but it's largely, uh, the, the status distribution is largely toward women, and the uh, you know, freedom-minded distribution is largely toward men, overall in society. Marriage, divorce, and divorce courts. The formal institution of marriage, as sanctioned by the state and religion, of course, is often favored by the conditioned woman since it brings a personal relationship into union with the violence of the state, which can be used to control men. And this has been traditionally used and steered to the benefit of the female, especially when a marriage ends in divorce. 80% of all divorces are initiated by women, mostly because real world men don't live up to their pre-programmed expectations. Divorce courts rule drastically in favor of women over 95% of the time. 95% of divorce court rulings are awarded to women in our society. Divorce rates will predictably continue to rise astronomically in our society as long as conditioned women remain attached to the types of unrealistic cultural expectations they have regarding relationships, regarding male-female relationships. These expectations are part of the quote unquote, no man is good enough for me princess programming. Money and the maintenance of lifestyle is almost always valued above emotions, feelings, and moral issues in modern relationships. Such a system is institutionally structured to break down the strength of both genders and therefore negatively impact future generations, meaning the children who are born out of these relationships. Attractiveness studies. One of the most interesting dynamics that I've come across in all of my research. Studies that have been conducted to appraise men and women's perceived attraction show that men are attracted to a far greater number of body types and overall physical features than women. Women, I'm sorry, when shown thousands of images of females with very diverse sets of physical characteristics, the average amount of women that in this group of thousands that men perceived as physically attractive was approximately 80%. Eight out of 10 were said to be acceptably physically attractive by the, uh, by the man regarding the thousands of images of women that they were shown in, this, in these studies. And this is a repeated, repeated result in many different attractiveness studies. Women, however, when shown thousands of images of males with also very diverse sets of physical characteristics, were attracted to an average of less 
than 20% of men. Actually, the, the number is approximately 18%. Now, if you look at the bell curve, and I hope it shows up okay on the slide, I hope you can see it, because it's sort of a thin line, maybe I should have highlighted it a little bit better. Look at the bell curve distribution. What, what you're seeing there is the number on the left, and the axis on, on the bottom there is um, when, who was rated least attractive and who was rated most attractive. Look at the perfect bell curve distribution of male appraisals of female attractiveness. It is the classic bell curve distribution. It can almost not even be more perfectly bell-shaped, okay? Now look at the shape of the curve when it comes to female appraisals of male attractiveness. That spike means that the vast majority of men, that spike up on the left-hand side means the vast majority of men that these, that the women who were, who con, they conducted these studies upon, found so many men unacceptably attractive. They rated them the least attractive. It's not, the, the, the median is not even in medium attractiveness. It's all the way skewed to completely unattractive. <laughs> and then on the right hand side, you see only a very, 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 very tiny fraction of men were perceived by women as very attractive. There is no one can possibly convince me that this is a naturally occurring phenomenon. No information that I could possibly be presented will convince me that that is a normal part of nature because nature doesn't do those things. Nature creates curves. Nature doesn't work in straight lines like that, okay? You are not going to see a non-natural distribution like that as part of something that happens naturally. That's social engineering. Such attractiveness studies demonstrate that women have an extremely limited range of characteristics which they find attractive in men. The drastic difference in the bell curve on these studies shows the blatantly skewed and unnatural divergence in women's preferences versus the smooth and naturally occurring median curve of men's preferences. The men's results show a natural selective preference, while the women's results display an artificially inflated selectivity that is indicative of social engineer socially engineered perceptions. Of course, Many people will incorrectly attribute this divergence to the old, tired, Darwinian scientism explanation that this is all about evolution and survival of the fittest, and men can produce an unlimited amount of sperm, while women can only produce one egg a month and have to be super selective about who they, they, they mate with, et cetera. And this is, you know, absolute bunk nonsense as far as I'm concerned, okay? I mean, again, nature doesn't produce results like that. Social engineering does. Now here's something that may be new, that very few people are willing to talk about, okay? How many people have seen my cosmic abandonment presentation by a show of hands? Okay, L probably less than half the room, but maybe about 50-50. Height, so this, is, this section is called Anunnaki programming. Does size really matter? Height is one of the top factors in the minds of programmed women when it comes to desires in male physical characteristics, or any characteristics for that matter. Why should this necessarily be so? Are taller men more moral? Are taller men more intelligent? Are taller men even more skillful than shorter men? The answer is that people perceive height as powerful and therefore desirable. This fact can be observed readily in the height of politicians, the height of CEOs and other people in positions of power throughout our society. But my question to that is, why should that dynamic even be so? Should height make anyone more qualified for a leadership position? Is height going to increase my skill to perform my, the set of skills that I need to perform my job? If I'm taller, am I gonna suddenly magically do my job better? You know, maybe if it involves reaching things that are what, you know, much higher than I. But aside from that, you know, 
you know, m maybe reach if you're involved in martial arts or boxing, reach comes into play. But, you know, uh, aside from things like that, you know, height does not make a person truly a better human being. Look at the average height, of I mean, look at the average heights of politicians, 6'5", 6 6'3", 6 6 6 6 6'1", 6 6'1", and on and on. It's almost like, forget about getting elected by the mind control public if you're under six feet tall. You know, it's not gonna happen, apparently, because you're just a better leader if you're farther away from the ground, I guess. The number one att attractiveness characteristic repeatedly listed by most women in all attractiveness studies as desirable in a potential male partner is repeatedly and consistently demonstrated to be height. In many cases, a man's true moral value system is considered by women only as a secondary factor, if at all. Almost all women on modern online dating sites insist upon knowing a man's height prior to meeting with him in person. Most women will even post their own height on the dating site, as they perceive height as so important that many of them actually believe that men are as obsessed about it as they are. I mean, how many men, how many men, single men out in the audience go into a dating site and go, oh my God, I gotta know how tall this woman is. Like, please tell me your height immediately. How many? Does anybody here, would that be one of the first things they would ask a woman on a dating site? I guarantee you not one in the room. Not a single one in the room. So what is the obsession with this? And you know, something else I discovered very coincidentally by studying this dynamic and, and seeing this repeatedly demonstrated online in online forums is there's a bitter hatred, a bitter, bitter hatred by tall women for shorter women. A bitter hatred. Tall women hate short women. Over and over again, I see that this, this vitriol, this viciousness displayed on forums by tall women to short women because they say, how dare you date the tall men? How dare you take the tall men away from us? We need the, the tall men. You have no right to them. We're taller than you. We have a right to those tall men. I swear, I'm not, I'm not making it up. This is an actual quote from a forum. I hate when short girls date tall guys. Us tall girls need them instead. I mean, what, is, what is this about? While most socially engineered women will claim that they would prefer as a potential partner a man who is six feet or taller, six feet tall or taller, listen to this statistic, ladies and gentlemen, especially ladies, the actual percentage of males in the total human population that are six feet zero inches or taller is exactly 12%. 12% of the human population, 88% of the entire male population is less than six feet zero inches tall on planet Earth. So just think about that as a eugenic strategy to condition women to only want that 12% of the population, largely, not all of them, okay, not speaking in blanket statements here. You are already controlling the population right there. The world height average, the only country on earth, the only country on earth that has an average height of six feet, and it is exactly six feet zero inches, is the country of Norway. No other country on earth has an average height of six feet for men. And I'll tell you what, that's directly because of the Anunnaki. That is directly because of the information that I talk about in cosmic abandonment. We're talking about the tall blonde people. Okay? That's why that those genetics are prevalent in that country. So the question looms, why exactly do women, women place such staggering importance upon male height, a factor that does not make any man more moral, more intelligent, more skillful, or even necessarily physically stronger than males of average or below average height? 
tell you what, some men who are shorter are built like pit bulls, low center of gravity, low to the ground, and can be even much more uh, vicious and, and physically dominating than taller men. Once again, the Darwinists will, will come out of the woodwork and trot out their tired and boring survival of the fittest nonsense to explain this. And that it doesn't hold any water because again, I mean, hey, with, with, with a sidearm, it don't matter how big you are. Okay, even with weapons of the past, some of the, the, the best warriors were that, that smaller, short status squat pit bull type men. You know, so it doesn't even make you physically stronger in most cases. In some cases it does. So why? Well, the true answer will require much more research and a total reevaluation of human history from the version of history that we have all been conditioned to accept. And people should see my cosmic abandonment presentation for more information on these occulted topics. The bottom line, folks, the Anunnaki, who were the beings that created humanity and who we considered gods for hundreds of thousands of years, who gave us our systems of religion, government, and money, and at times ruled over us with unquestioned, ruthless power and with technology that seemed completely supernatural to us, were an average of nine feet tall. An average of nine feet tall. You know what? That's all still completely intertwined in our ancestral DNA and our ancestral memory. That's why most people consider height a factor in leadership and in attraction and in the ability to, to, to do things in, as a, a preference that should be desired. It has nothing to do with any kind of better survival mechanism. It has to do with the beings that already were in positions of power and influence on this world for hundreds of thousands of years were over nine feet tall. Even today, people still associate height with power for this very reason, especially the conditioned woman, who's traditionally tended to flock to the men who controlled the most resources since that would lead to a more comfortable way of life for them. And that is exactly why women also directly inbred with these beings. Oh, by the way, let me just go back to that slide. By the way, folks, take a look at some of these images, okay? From Sumer on the left there, the god Enki presiding on his throne above other small human beings. I mean, a being like that would be over 12 feet tall, most likely. Look at, uh, in from, out of Egypt, a tall being. You know, there's nothing allegorical being portrayed here, people. He's holding three human beings by their hair. <laughs> you want to give me an allegory to explain that one? <laughs> That's how strong they were, too. They could snap a human neck like a small twig. Watch the new movie, Gods of Egypt. You'll see the Anunnaki in action in that movie. Also portrayed as shapeshifters. The appearance of confidence, false appearance of confidence in society. The conditioned woman generally ends up in unfulfilled relationships, even after finding a, quote, man with the qualities she believed she wanted. The reason for this is that the qualities such conditioned women were programmed to desire at a subconscious level are almost always in direct opposition to what they genuinely, deep in the core of their being, desired and, and wanted and needed. This dynamic also works in reverse. A good example of how it works in reverse is the conditioning that inauthentic women receive to desire so-called confidence, and I put that in quotes, quote-unquote confidence in a man. Yet when they encounter men, when the inauthentic or the conditioned woman in our culture actually encounters men who possess true male confidence, they will often attempt to break down that confidence, to rip it down, to ridicule that man and to call them know-it-alls. What such women have actually been conditioned to do, to want, is the illusion of confidence in a man. Yet when they actually encounter true male confidence in a man, they want to run away from the real thing. 
the hypersexualization of women in our culture and slut shaming. Now, women are hypersexualized in mass media, in advertising, and in pornography, yet they are actively discouraged in our society from having healthy sex lives. And this encouragement for them you know, not to have sex, not to have healthy sexual lives, ha happens through the neo-feminist technique known as slut shaming. It's very prominent, very prevalent in society. They use this form of social fear as a method of control through media and pop culture. And the, the fear is an ongoing thing to get their peers to ridicule them. This is done with women and men. Women see other women who are, have healthy sexual lives and they say, you're a slut, you're giving it away. When, when you can get, you know, get something in return. You know, it's not about the shared interaction, the shared familial dynamic between man and woman. You know, that is about, you know, building bonds and experiencing pleasure and joy. You know, it's about what can I get for it? You know, and this is reinforced by men too. You know, men see women with a healthy sexual libido and say, oh, a slut or it's unde she's undesirable because she's had too many partners. You know, uh, this is absolute, like a neo-puritanical view of sex that is still so prevalent in our society because of religious indoctrination that is still very prevalent in our society. Here's a great quote from an anonymous person on a message board that I encountered when looking up the concept of slut shaming, okay? It says, he said, I th he or she said, I think the reason most women have unhealthy sexual lives is because they are trained to hate sex. When I was in school, our sex education classes actually taught us that sex was risky, that quote unquote good girls withhold and avoid sex at all costs, that men only want to use women for sex, and therefore we should be suspicious of all sexual interests, that sex will hurt, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There is still the very strong idea that women who like and want sex are slutty and undesirable. And then there are the women who learn to hate sex so much that they actually never experience orgasm, meaning that even when they do have sex, they do not enjoy it, and so they eventually avoid it altogether. Ladies and gentlemen, the disturbing statistic that is reality is that over half of women never experience orgasm during a sexual experience with men. Over half. Not under, like not right, even right at half, more than half. I just want to go back real quickly, if I may, to this other image. You know, look at all the things that women are called, you know, if they have a healthy libido. Easy, fast, whore, dirty, slut, sex kitten, loose, floozy, skank, hoe, wench, tramp, asking for it, sleeping around, hooker, siren, prostitute. That's what most people think just the person with a healthy libido is. A woman with a, sex, with a healthy sex life, a healthy libido is. I mean, it's, that's a disgrace that someone should endure being, you know, called things like that. And women do it to other women. Um, the dynamic of sex as money to the manipulated woman, sex has largely become a form of commerce in our society, sadly. A business transaction, that's what the actual magical experience, the shared magical experience between man and woman of sex has become in a lot of women's minds, a lot of manipulated women's minds, a business transaction. The desire for money has become completely tied up and twisted into the motivation for any type of sexual relationship between man and woman. The mindset goes something like this. If I have sex with this man, what resources can I continue to get from him long term? Men chase so hard after money for this very reason. Again, the manipulated man. They chase that money to attract women who want that money. Both genders still continue to prop up money as the most powerful religious belief system on the face of the earth. And make no, no mistake about it, folks, that's what the monetary system is. It is the religion of the bulk of this, the people on this planet. A great deal of socially engineered women 
have come to generally accept that sex, from a man's point of view, is just the same whether it is part of an intimate relationship or whether he is paying a call girl or a prostitute for it, believing that since the biological act is the same, they carry equal value in a man's mind. The prostitute has something that he wants, so just exchange money for it like a business transaction. The free will, voluntary and mutual exchange of emotions and physicality as part of the genuine human sexual experience is not alike to quote unquote paying for it in any way whatsoever. And the genuine man and the genuine woman knows this. The socially conditioned woman will often largely discount male emotions with a shallow view, which is actually a form of misandry, which I'm gonna talk about tomorrow. Many social, sex has a means of control by the inauthentic or culturally conditioned woman. Many socially engineered women have been conditioned that it is perfectly acceptable to use sexuality as a means of manipulating and controlling men to get them to do what they want and to give them the resources that they desire in exchange for sex or even just for the promise of sex, dangling it over their head. While one could claim that this is not technically immoral behavior, since it is voluntarily complied with on the part of many men, it is certainly a very low consciousness view of human sexuality and a low consciousness view of the exchange of energy in human relationships. Again, I'm not saying there should be no prostitution or anything like that. I think, hey, if it's voluntary, do it. I'm not saying there should be rampant promiscuity in our society either, okay? Uh, you know, I'm just saying, while this is a, a voluntary, um, you know, exchange, it, look at how much it, it actually diminishes the real value of the genuine thing, which can be transformative. You know, people think about sex because it is a powerful transformative form of energy exchange, you know? And look at how it's being used. The satanic mindset, this is all part of the satanic mindset. The satanic mindset plays a major role in the psychology of neo-feminism. Many neo-feminists openly claim that they identify with the ideology of Satanism. The first tenet of the satanic ideology is the dictum that, quote, self-preservation is the highest law. Put in other words, the survival and comfort of the physical self is always, more um, always a more important goal than doing what is morally right. Live only for yourself and care only about you and yours. If you must step on others to get what you want, then so be it, for this is a dog-eat-dog -dog world. Ladies and gentlemen, above all else, that's what Satanism is. Above all else, that's what Satanism is. And most people have no idea that not only is that what Satanism is, but that they're in that mindset. That they are living as a Satanist. The ideologies that clearly define the overarching worldview of Satanism is perpetual me, me, me thinking, ego gratification, hedonism, and always wanting to be in control of other people. Would you agree that the vast majority of the individuals in our society subscribe to such a satanic worldview? I know I would. You know, I call their worldview mini-me Satanism. You know, you can look at the real dark occultists who know this openly as Dr. Evil, who are sit sitting on the Iron Throne or desire to sit on the Iron Throne. But the population is many me who are molded to be like them and to want power over other people in the same respect that the, the real controllers of our planet want and desire power at all times and places. The dominator or doormat syndrome. What has now become attractive to the socially conditioned, the socially engineered woman, is the inauthentic alpha male who acts as the dominator or the controller, okay, the dominator, or the inauthentic beta male who is the doormat or who seeks to be controlled, what many people in the MIGTO movement refer to as the mangina. <laughs> the inauthentic woman now desires the corporate cosmo man, the metrosexual, the androgynous hipster, the inauthentic man of every kind, 
Men also fall for this programming through TV, movies, mainstream media, magazines, and popular music, and seek to become what the conditioned woman is attracted to, i.e. the dominator or the doormat. Again, playing the game of control, either wanting to be controlled by someone else or wanting to control someone else. The war on testosterone. A biological war on testosterone is being waged on both men and women by the social engineers. Testosterone is a vital hormone for the physiological and psychological health of both men and women. It could be seen as the will hormone or the drive hormone. Low testosterone levels in either gender ultimately destroy vitality and normal human sex drive, and it acts as a means of population control and eugenics when testosterone is destroyed in men and women. If the testosterone level of a male is too low, sex drive is significantly diminished and overall vitality and masculine traits are greatly reduced. In other words, over time, the human male will become feminized with a lack of proper testosterone levels. The influence of testosterone on the human male, growth of facial hair, growth of body hair, supports collagen, sperm production, prostate growth, erectile function, uh, muscle mass, strength, sex drive, positive feelings, aids cognition, aids memory, red blood cell production, bone density maintenance. Just about every form of strength and vitality that can be produced by the human body is supported by the hormone testosterone in a male. Women also require testosterone, although in smaller amounts than men. If lacking in this hormone, women become over-feminized, depressed, weaker in overall strength, and vitality, and their sex drive is usually completely destroyed. Symptoms of low testosterone in women, poor tolerance for exercise, dry skin, thinning skin, loss of motivation, loss of muscle tone, loss of bone density, weight gain around the abdomen, depression, anxiety. Common symptoms, anxiety, mood swings, hot flashes, low sex drive, and accumulation of fat. One of the things that keeps testosterone levels normalized is a healthy libido. It's a cycle. One thing drives the other thing. Across the board, modern medical doctors have seen a disturbing trend of testosterone levels plummeting significantly for both genders. This is no accident. Instead of alerting people to this fact and trying to understand why this is happening, Modern doctors have been deliberately reducing the levels of testosterone that are considered normal for both genders in medical testing and literature. The war on human sexuality is being waged through the war on testosterone in our society in both males and females. The methods of attack, putting people through absolute rat wheel work environments. You know, stress, food, GMO food, the pesticides in food, the hormones in dairy and meat, alcohol and drug consumption, fluoride in the drinking water, BPA in the plastics, SSRI drugs, what I call the demon drugs, totally destroy testosterone levels, cell phone radiation, cell tower radiation, chemtrails, radionics through things like harp, mind control, through the television, the mass media, skewing the perceptions of men and women, the feminization of men, you know, destroying sex drive through pornography as well, or manipulating sexual preferences through pornography. The destruction of the familial dynamic is what this is all leading to. The attack upon the natural sexual familial dynamic in society tremendously destabilizes the ability for people to establish firm foundations in relationships, in morality, in health, and in real education. Entire industries thrive on this social disease. The true, true moral values can be devastated through the destroyed familial dynamic due to the lack of proper parenting that ends up being the result. Children raised with little to no moral values will eventually have a different value system grafted upon them by schooling, by mainstream media, and popular entertainment, and their peers who have often gone through a similar process of moral degradation. Money will eventually become their only value system in their minds. They're trying to breed out righteous anger through this agenda. Conditioned women are being engineered to reject all forms of the emotion of anger when displayed by a male. 
from a very early age, they are taught the new age deception that anger is an invalid emotion that human beings, especially men, should not openly display. Of course, this tactic is used to suppress righteous indignation toward the iniquities that are taking place in our world so that the powers that be can go on ruling unchallenged. Lincoln said, you, thank you. Lincoln said, you can tell the greatness of a man by what makes him angry. The inauthentic man, man, they're feminizing the human male. The war on authentic men takes the form of the emasculation of the human male, a process which breeds out the sacred masculine dynamic, which is the willingness to stand up to tyrants and bullies with physical self-defensive force if necessary. The long-term agenda is to create a feminized man that will not ever challenge the state and to simultaneously condition women to view the state as an all-powerful husband-slash-father figure. The conditioned woman at a subconscious level chooses the feminized man who will not stand up for himself since her perception has been influenced to see that man as one who is the most suited to survive for the very reason that he will not place himself in danger by challenging the violence of the state. The corporate suit and tie guy is mistakenly seen by the conditioned woman as a man of long-term value because he has money in place of a genuine man that possesses the skill set to thrive in a natural world survival scenario. For example, a man that can survive beyond the corporate or digital world. Most feminized and emasculated men, including most of the corporate suit and tie guys, will most likely be dead on day one in a true survival scenario. I have two more, a couple more slides. They're breeding out the rebels in our society, folks. Rebellion against the state, a reverence for true freedom, and placing high value on personal responsibility and individual rights are traits that are being deliberately bred out of humanity through the epigenetics agenda because such traits are undesirable to the ruling class. Socially engineered traits being bred into the new human include a fear of going against the norm, docility, submissiveness, obedience to authority, and going along to get along as depicted by the gentleman in this picture. But hey, ladies, he's hot. He loves hot girls. Yeah. That's what a real man looks like right there. You know, when I was looking for images of rebels, you know, that one came up. The three percenters, they're here, and they're not going anywhere. And we're taking our rights back. We're not asking for them. They, they were never anybody else's to take. But, you know, the first image I was going to go with here was this one. You know, there's the image of the, the new masculine man. You know, that's, that's Charlie Brown. You know, he got his football back from Lucy, by the way. <laughs> you see the football there? Yeah. Yeah, I got a kick out of that meme on Facebook. Last couple slides. Neo-feminism is a mind control-based eugenics program designed to breed compliant slaves. That's what it's ultimately about, folks. It is designed to perpetuate human slavery. It is designed to eliminate rebels, independent thinkers, and spiritually awake human beings. One of the most fundamental aspects of the program is to influence the vast majority of women to be attracted only to men who are the most fitting to perpetuate the system of human slavery. And that's why we've gone from rebels like the, the American revolutionaries to so-called men like this. No society wants you to become wise. It is against the investment of all societies. If people are wise, they cannot be exploited. If they are intelligent, they cannot be subjugated. They cannot be forced into a mechanical life to live like robots. They will have the fragrance of rebellion all about them. In fact, a wise man is a fire, alive, a flame. He would like rather to die than to be enslaved. <laughs> Folks, the agenda being pushed by neo-feminism is our future if we don't stop it. I'm gonna to end today with a quote from George Orwell's 1984. Do you begin to see then what kind of world we are creating? It is the exact opposite of the stupid hedonistic utopias that the old reformers imagined. A world of fear and treachery, of torment, a world of trampling and being trampled upon, a world which will grow not less but more merciless as it refines itself. 
progress in our world will be progress toward more pain. The old civilizations claimed that they were founded on love and justice. Ours is founded upon hatred. In our world, there will be no emotions except fear, rage, triumph, and self-abasement. Everything else we shall destroy. Everything. Already we are breaking down the habits of thought which have survived from before our revolution. We have cut the links between child and parent. We have cut the links between man and man and between man and woman. No one dares trust a wife or a child or a friend any longer. But in the future, there will be no wives and no friends. Children will be taken from their mothers at birth as one takes eggs from a hen. The sex instinct will be eradicated. Procreation will be an annual formality like the renewal of a ration card. We shall abolish the orgasm. Our neurologists are at work upon it now. There will be no loyalty except loyalty toward the party. There will be no love except the love of Big Brother. Ladies and gentlemen, to see how this may possibly turn out and to hear the solutions I have to present, you'll have to hear me talk tomorrow evening. Thank you for your kind attention. I am going to tell you that last night I realized that my inauthentic woman has been at battle with my authentic woman. And it was really helpful because I could give myself credit for the authentic part and I could kind of recognize the inauthentic part for the first time. So now I can have a little more peace between those two parts of myself because one of them might have been inherited from my society. And fuck that shit. So, we have this brilliant man here. My husband Bob and I, we went back to the hotel room and Bob said, that guy is a genius. It's true. We really, all of us have so much appreciation for you, Mark, and what you have done and the ability for you to communicate to that to us in a coherent manner. So without further ado. So uh, let's get into part two of the unholy feminine, neo-feminism and the satanic epi-eugenics agenda. Yesterday I went through many of the methodologies that the neo-feminism agenda uses against women and men to divide the genders against each other and incite the gender war to weaken the entire population. Uh, I called these methods the war against the goddess because they are a direct attack on the authentic sacred feminine that both women and men really carry within themselves. So this part is called the war against the goddess continued. After this, I'll be going through solutions that I consider we can employ to heal the divide between the genders. One of the next methods of manipulation I want to talk about is the concept of male privilege, this myth that is propagated by the neo-feminist ideology. So-called male privilege is the neo-feminist idea that men are somehow given distinct social advantages over women based primarily upon their gender, just because they are men. Now, I don't know how many people in the audience or out there watching on the internet actually believe this, but I'll tell you one thing, nobody ever, ever gave me anything just because I'm a man. As a matter of fact, I've really kind of noticed the exact opposite, quite in fact, that uh, you know, sometimes open hostility can be shown because you're a masculine man in many instances, uh, and uh, things can be withheld. I certainly never experienced this concept of being privileged because I'm male. Um, you know, looking at these couple of photos here, you know, w women making this assumption are obviously really not too much keeping in in reality, in line with reality, as far as I'm concerned. If we look at the uh, percentages of uh, certain aspects of society, you look at deaths by combat, 97% of men, 90% uh, of people who suffer combat death are men, while only 3% are women. Industrial deaths and accidents are suffered by, no, uh, that comprise 93% male deaths and only 7% female deaths. 
Uh, homicide victims, uh, three quarters to one quarter, 76% men versus 24% women. Suicide victims, it's an 80-20 split. And uh, cu in custody battles after divorce usually, the winner of uh, a custody uh, suit is uh, women by a margin of 84% to 16. The um, corporate world is largely driven by women insofar as purchases of goods and services. We talked about that when we talked about rampant consumerism yesterday. 80% uh, of consumption performed by women in society, females in society. Uh, the numbers that I got recently said that it was closer to an 85-15 breakdown, as I talked about yesterday. In politics, 54% of women are voters, 60% of uh, the welfare recipients are female. Infrastructural workers, meaning people who actually build uh, all of the infrastructure and technology that we use on a daily basis, are 80% of that, those are male. 90% of inventors and innovators are male, and 65% of the tax-paying population, which I think should go down to zero, of course, but 65% currently feeding into that system are male. So, um, you know, it's difficult to see by a lot of these uh, ratios and a lot of these statistics how there could possibly be an actual real thing known as male privilege in society. I personally don't see it as anything that is real. I see it as an invented concept to further try to drive a wedge between men and women in our culture. Women and order followers. This is another a huge dynamic that has to be understood when it comes to the neo-feminism agenda and the conditioned state of many inauthentic females. Most order followers are men. This is what I talked about last year at the conference, okay? Uh, order followers and the destruction of the sacred feminine within themselves. Order following men are the creators, the boots on the ground creators of what I call the dark new world order, the, the system of human enslavement, because they're the ones who are actually doing the coercive action and the immoral uh, violent behavior against other human beings. But women consistently support dominators and order followers throughout their entire careers and lives. How many women support what these dominators and order followers do? I mean, they have mothers who support them and say that they're proud of their jobs and professions. They have sisters, they have wives, they have daughters. And these women in their lives continuously support them. Now, how many of their wives, mothers, sisters, or daughters would continue to sanction the behaviors of order following men if they were to wake up to the agenda that they're being used for and what they're actually being used to create, the type of slavery system that they're being employed to create? You know, how many women would actually say, no, I will not take part in what you're doing by supporting you in any way or even having a relationship with you in any way? You know, the, some of the memes here show what the problems are. You know, uh, supporting the troops, not always logical, you know? It's difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on his not understanding it. What a great quote. And I would say it's difficult to get a woman to stop supporting a man who's doing an immoral behavior when his salary is contributing to benefit in her life and comfort in her life. See, that's what people have to be willing to walk away from, even if, cre if, even if it creates temporary discomfort or temporary chaos in their lives. And that takes courage to do. Women's support, and again, again, I want to qualify, we're talking about the inauthentic woman throughout the ages, the mind-controlled woman, the, the socially en engineered woman. The inauthentic woman has traditionally sided with conquerors, dominators, and tyrants, both during and after wars throughout history. Flocking to the side of the victor or whoever is currently in control of the resources has been a historical pattern for conditioned women for thousands of years. We see this pattern over and over and over again. Women have been conditioned to simply go with the winner, with whoever is happening to control resources at any given time, in any given geographic region. I mean, after World War II in Germany, when the troops uh, from, of the Allies came in and displaced the Nazis, women who were there are countless reports that women who were 
with the Nazis one day were then you know, sleeping with Allied soldiers the next day, as if nothing had ever happened and just, it was just a replacement of, of the physical male body that they were happened to be around because they were now in control of the region and in control of the resources of the region. And you know, of course, a lot of atrocities happen in warfare times and you know, there's like accounts that starvation was, was occurring uh, and they starved out a lot of the troops, uh, uh, the Nazi troops after the, the, the uh, war, after their surrender. Uh, and, I, you know, in general, women didn't want to, I guess, be subject to that in many cases and just went with the winning side. They didn't stay loyal to the, 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 the people who were defeated, that they had supported right up until the very bitter end, but immediately went with the conquerors or the new winners. And again, I would say this is not a normal thing for them to do. People will make the argument that's just a natural, normal thing. No, it's a socially conditioned thing that they've been taught to do. That's a learned behavior. Androgyny is one of the other main attacks of neo-feminism. It's, it's a methodology to destabilize a population. Another tactic of neo-feminism, epigenics, is the deliberate androgenization of society. Androgenization slowly homogenizes and gradually erodes the distinctiveness of both, genders, of both male and female. When genders and gender roles become skewed and blended, strong men and strong women sharing cohesive fa familial bonds become an endangered species. As a result of that breakdown of the familial dynamic between men and women, society becomes weakened at a very fundamental level. And why is that? You know, and again, this is not an attack on any alternative sexualities out there, okay? I wanna make that very clear. This is explaining that the vast majority of human sexual interaction is between men and women, and when you androgenize that or you uh, gradually erode the distinctiveness between the genders and you, you're breaking down that familial bond that they can create together, you're weakening a society because you are ultimately going to create not only a divide between man and woman, but a divide between parents and children as a result of that breakdown, of that familial breakdown. So then that translates down to uh, the next generation, especially when it comes to good parenting in many cases. Hand in hand with androgenization is the, again, the feminization of the male gender, okay? So we see the metrosexual in society. And we see what is now known as the lumber sexual. Let me explain the lumber sexual, sexual to people, okay? The lumber sexual is the type of man who really doesn't have inherent masculine traits, but wants to portray them anyway, wants to fake them or feign them. So he'll dress up like a quote real man might look or a masculine man like might look a genuine man. And um, you know, this is a trend going around in hipster culture right now for people who are familiar with it. Uh, the, the lumber sexuals are all over my neighborhood in South Philadelphia, <laughs> everywhere. Uh, this meme says, I'm so glad I don't have to actually hunt I have no fucking clue where gluten-free tacos live. Right? So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's comical, it's, 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 it's you know, funny, but it's true. It's like, you know, we're seeing this proxy of trying to be a man, not the real thing, you know? And again, I'm not saying everybody has to be Mr. Macho. Don't twist my words or take it to an extreme that I'm not saying. Saying, you know, there is such a thing as genuine masculinity. And, you know, instead of embracing that, you know, uh, most men are be becoming overly feminized. This is, again, uh, uh, part of the agenda through food, through medication, through things in the water supply and in the air. Uh, and, um, you know, it, it's basically depleting testosterone levels in men, as I talked about yesterday, and creating the, this effeminized male who then is trying to overcompensate by looking masculine, even though he doesn't actually have those characteristics within him. And, you know, women are being conditioned to be attracted to that type of uh, emasculated male as well. Some of the uh, other side effects of things uh, that neo-feminism propagates is the types of negative repercussions that we're seeing in things like social media, uh, you know, Facebook, uh, Twitter, 
YouTube, Pinterest, et cetera. Um, social media is furthering the agenda to create division between men and women. And I mean, you could see these types of arguments and threat and flame wars all over social media. Many conditioned women are now employing social media as a mechanism for what I call collecting men. Okay? So they're, they're basically creating like shopping lists of men to find out what they can do for them and how much attention that they can garner from them. Um, they often will, th this inauthentic form of woman will actually view men as a commodity on a grocery item checklist and view the social media outlet that she's using to do this uh, and to get these things done for her as like a shopping venue, like going into a store. Uh, social media websites have further been employed to destroy real social interaction. This is the main thing that they're being used to do in this agenda. You know, you're not having people meet in person anymore. They're just talking online. And, you know, they're not actually developing real social interactive skills. You know, they're just interacting virtually. And this is, it's done to destroy real social interaction between people, especially men and women. And also this, uh, the secondary effect that this has is it emboldens rudeness between people. Because the way people talk to each other online, they would never talk to each other like that in person, you know. Um, they would definitely think twice about it, you know, doing that, you know, physically right in front of another person. There's little incentive, very little incentive to be nice to somebody when you can get away with saying anything in the virtual online world. This is part of how uh, women are using social media and part of some of the uh, ancillary effects that social media is having in the form of driving a wedge between men and women. The so-called millennials, the millennial generation, the millennial quote woman, these are, the, these are the children of the post-baby boomer generation and were largely raised by state-run educational system, television, and pop culture. They've been conditioned by these systems to behave in ways that are complacent, compliant, unquestioning, unthinking, and narcissistic. They absorb large amounts of television programming, consume poisonous genetically modified food, are obsessed with escapist pursuits, and can only have vapid, inane conversations and express an extreme lack of concern or interest in real world issues. They are the absolute dream of the social engineer controllers. The reason I brought this up is because I've had a little bit of interaction with millennial women uh, over the last few years. And when I see women of this age group, it's all, they're all sadly, very sadly, almost universally alike in the uh, patterns of behavior and the tendencies that they express. I actually had a young woman uh, just pre-college age, like maybe um, uh, senior in high school age, like 17, 18 years old, uh, say to me, directly to my face in person, uh, I would prefer that someone else do my thinking for me. Actually made that statement to my face. You know, th this is how conditioned they have this younger generation. This is what the school system is doing to young people, especially young women. It's seen as uncool to care about anything. Anything serious, any topic that is serious, the, t the conversation has to be as inane as humanly possible as it, it can be made, particularly among this, this generational group. Uh, there was a, uh, there's a common phrase in uh, America in Western culture in particular, that ignorance is bliss. Mm -hmm. I've said before, ignorance is death. It'll lead to our destruction. But in the ancient Egyptian tradition or the Kemetic tradition, there was a common phrase about ignorance and it's, it, it said, ignorance is evil. It is the essence of evil to ignore truth. And I couldn't agree with that statement more. The consciousness of the so-called millennial woman has been programmed from birth by the state thanks to the complacency of their parents' generation, a generation largely that surrendered their freedom, abandoned health and nutrition for quote-unquote convenience, traded their spiritual and moral values for those that they garnered from sitcom television, and handed their children over to the corporatized state where their minds were molded like clay into the types of inauthentic males and inauthentic females that we're discussing here today. 
Another technique that is being employed, particularly on the religious side of this agenda, because again, there's a political side to this agenda, a social side to the agenda, and a religious side to this agenda, is called neo-puritanicalism. And this is rampant in our society. It's a very, very unhealthy attitude toward human sexuality. A religious puritanical mindset is being slowly reinfused into Western culture by religious fundamentalism. Such religionists are demonizing consensual sexual relationships between adults and pushing the notion that normal human sexuality is somehow sinful or even evil. They try to convince people that everyone in American culture is obsessed with sex, when in fact all people in American culture are obsessed with is the idea of sex, but not the act itself. This is due to the level of sexual repression that is taking place within our culture. Every westernized culture is actually more sexually repressed now than ever before in its history. And this dynamic is becoming worse and worse due to the growing influence of this neo-puritanical ideology. This religious and cultural engineering to demonize a healthy attitude toward normal human sexuality uh, this is religious and cultural engineering to demonize a healthy attitude toward normal human sexuality and to reduce the human population through voluntary abstinence. Now again, don't twist my words and make it into something extreme that I'm not saying. I'm not telling people go out and have rampant, wild, promiscuous sex with everyone indiscriminately. I'm just saying that the attitude toward a healthy libido and a healthy sex life is constantly repressed in our culture. And this is a religious, it's a fundamentalist religious influence. I could tell you a little anecdote about this story. Um, a while back, someone, I can't remember where it was or who said it to me, but I was in a discussion with a woman and she said something to the effect that um, for women to have any kind of a healthy sex life that is not deliberately being withheld by them, okay, is akin to someone standing outside of a bakery and giving cakes away for free, and how would the people who own the bakery feel about that? that? Now think about that for a minute. Think about that anecdote for a minute. She said women having sex and having a healthy sex life is akin, is, is very much like somebody standing outside of a bakery giving away free cake. Okay? Now think about how unhealthy of an attitude that is about the normal sexual, human sexual experience that is supposed to be about bonding with another person, emotions shared between another person, physicality shared between another person. All they're thinking of it as, as it's some type of a monetary exchange or it's some type of a thing where you could be so shamed for doing it, it's like you're giving away the goods for free instead of getting something in return and you're making, devaluing it for all of us. Now that's more of a, uh, again, a financial motivation for the withholding of sex, but this goes hand in hand with the neo-puritanical religious worldview that sex should just be continuously withheld. And it's something that is uh, something that, you know, should only be like done for things like procreation. Um, again, I don't have a wild, radical sexual view about that it should be done completely indiscriminately. There is uh, obviously emotions tied in with the act, but to view this in the, total biblical sense as something that should be viewed as sinful is definitely part of the neo-feminist agenda and part of a religious fundamentalist agenda that ties in with the neo-feminist agenda. It's all there for population control ultimately. Hand in hand with neo-puritanicalism goes the myth of hookup culture. And this is completely fake, does not exist, does not exist anywhere on the planet, okay? It's an invention. This is, the, this is the idea that, um, uh, that is brought up by the mind-controlled religionists, the, the radical Christian right, the fake Christian religionists. They spread this notion that hookup culture exists and is rampant in our society. And what they claim it is, is an atmosphere of total promiscuity, total one-night stands, and total casual sex going around everywhere in our culture. That, that Americans are totally obsessed with sex and are having it randomly and indiscriminately everywhere. Okay, I don't know how many people here have experienced what is known as hookup culture. If you've actually experienced hookup culture, raise your hand. No. <laughs> a couple of people, like a couple of people, maybe five people in the five or six people in the entire room. Okay, I'm, 
I'm saying it's such a limited thing that it is practically non-existent. This is an invention. They're taking small isolated pockets where some promiscuity might take place and they're saying, this is going on everywhere and everybody's doing it and it's a rampant problem throughout society. If anything, attitudes about sex are becoming increasingly more repressed day after day in this culture, okay? And people make a radically wild, bigger deal about it than it is, okay? They're not looking at it indiscriminately and not looking at it frivolously at all. Hookup culture is an invention of the religion, of religion and social engineering to make religious minded people believe that there is a wild sex craze culture that they are being protected from or that they need protection from by buying into their puritanical religious ideology. This is what the agenda really is doing. And again, this is all to get people to think about sexual, normal sexual activity in a completely unhealthy and repressed way. So that what ultimately happens is you end up with population reduction voluntarily conducted by the population that the eugenics agenda is designed to cull, getting the herd to cull itself. Hand in hand with the fallacy of hookup culture is the fallacy of rape culture. So-called rape culture is also a PSYOP invent invention and is not actually taking place. This is not at all to say that rape does not take place or it is not an extremely vicious crime and an overall problem in human society. Again, don't take my words out of context and twist them. But the claim that there is a formally justified culture of rape being propped up within our society is patently absurd. If there is any institutionalized acceptance of rape in human culture, it is in the prison system where the highest numbers number of rapes in America take place, and those rapes take place upon men, not women. That's where the highest number of rapes are taking place on a daily basis in the world, is in the United States prison system. The myth of rape culture is ultimately propagated by the social engineers to keep us in constant fear of each other. Now, once again, you know, you can react viscerally if you want, of course, does rape take place? Yes, it does. It's a crime that takes place every day. We're not talking about rape. Look at the words on the screen. Rape culture. The question is, is there a culture, a sanctioned culture of rape in America or any other country, country for that world? In some Middle Eastern regimes, yeah, there may be. In some radical Islamicist regimes, you know, rape may be officially sanctioned religiously and in law, you know? But I'm talking about in the West. In Western culture, there is no such thing as rape culture. Rape culture in the West is a myth. It's an illusion propagated by neo-feminists, okay? It's done to propagate fear. Again, this is all about fear of normal human sexual interaction. This is the theme here in this section. Propagate fear of normal sexual activity, okay? You get people in fear, they, they start procreating less, population is reduced, you're seeing less of the traits that you don't want to see in the culture. This is done to keep us in constant fear of each other. It drives the wedge between the genders. For example, the, the, the phrase that you hear by a lot of neo-feminists, every man is a potential rapist. I mean, this is the most ridiculous, nonsensical thing I've ever heard in my life. And it's, it's, it's total, it's man-hating. I mean, that's blatant misandry, blatant man-hatred. And all it does is further isolate the genders, creating the further war uh, divide in the gender war. Here's one you can get as, as offended about as you like, and I know uh, Bob Tuscan will, will love this part of the uh, presentation. Uh, the AIDS hoax, this is another thing. There, AIDS doesn't exist, ladies and gentlemen. There's no such thing as AIDS, okay? AIDS is a disease that is caused by lifestyle and malnutrition, okay? HIV doesn't cause AIDS. There is no HIV test. There is simply an antibody test for HIV, which you can, which over 60 different independent diseases can cause a positive result on an HIV test, okay? Luke 
Montagnier, the co-discoverer of HIV with Robert Gallo, has publicly stated that he himself no longer believes HIV causes AIDS and that AIDS can be cured with nutrition. AIDS was used primarily as an epigenetics scare tactic. Again, it's fear. Get people afraid of normal sexual interaction. Okay? That's what dominates the mindset in particularly Western culture when it comes to sexual interaction is fear, 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 and more fear. It was, the AIDS hoax was an epigenetics scare tactic to make people fearful of having sex because this is a sexually transmitted disease that you can actually die from, okay? I have never met an individual in my life with so-called AIDS. Not one, zero. As a matter of fact, I have never met a person who knows a person with AIDS. And I might today, you might tell me you know somebody who, who had it, but this is a disease that is brought on by lifestyle and nutrition issues, okay? That's what causes the body to go into autoimmune response and attack itself, okay? It is not caused by HIV. People have to get that through their head and start understanding HIV is not the cause of AIDS. And it is not really, truly a quote, sexually transmitted disease. Yeah. They want, they, yeah, thank you. I knew you'd like that, Bob. I had to throw that in. Yeah. See, abstinence always slows down a population. It always slows down population rates for eugenicists who are seeking to keep the population small and manageable. So you want to encourage abstinence as much as possible. You want to have an atmosphere of fear regarding sexuality and propagate that fear as much as possible. You want to propagate what we talked about yesterday, slut shaming. You want to propagate a puritanical view of sex, okay? You, one thing you don't want is normal attitudes about human sexuality and normal familial bonding between strong men and strong women. You don't want that. They don't want that. Because that's what makes a population strong and independently thinking and freedom oriented in their mindset. You don't want that if you're a eugenicist social engineer that wants slavery. You want to breed your cattle the way you need them to be bred. And here's the, here is the testing grounds for the farmers. The testing ground for the human farmers is the nation of Japan. And let me tell you something, everything they're doing there is coming here. It's already well underway here, okay? They have culled the Japanese population already. And you know, you know, we could talk about Fukushima doing that even further and what it's good, the havoc it's going to wreak on sexual reproduction in Japan, all right? And that's no accident. It's no accident. You know, what happens in consciousness gets reflected on the grand scale when it comes to cataclysmic de destruction in, in human lives and in, and in the environment as well, because consciousness is directly related to those eventualities. The Japanese intimacy crisis, if you haven't heard about this, I suggest you get online and start researching it immediately. Japan is experiencing what is being called in their own media, in their own mainstream media, they had to acknowledge it because that's how bad the problem is. An epidemic intimacy crisis. And Japan has the fastest declining population rate in the entire world. Almost half the population of Japan claims that it is no longer interested in any kind of sexual intimacy. Let me just repeat that. Half of the population of human beings that live in the nation of Japan say that they are no longer is interested at all in any kind of human sexual interaction. Okay? That's what the social engineers have accomplished. They're techno sorcerers, ladies and gentlemen. That's what these social engineers are. They are techno sorcerers. Uh, I want to get back to that point after I finish reading the stats on this slide because I want to make a point regarding what's really going on in Japan and it's starting to go on here. This is happening because of destroyed sex drives in both genders due to extremely low testosterone levels, which I talked about the importance of testosterone for normal vitality, strength, and human sexuality yesterday. Japan is merely the social engineer's testing ground for their depopulation agenda. The American intimacy crisis has already begun. It is already well underway, folks. It's just unspoken. Not many people will, will have the courage, like myself, to stand up here and talk about these issues because they don't want to be alienated from other people who they're afraid of what they think. Now, I don't care what you think of me. 
I'm telling you what's going on and what I know is directly, directly being directed by the people who I used to work, used to work with and for. I'm telling you, they told me that they were conducting these eugenics agendas. And I didn't believe it coming out of their mouth. And I'm no longer laughing about it, folks. I'm no longer saying, oh, no, you, you can't possibly do that to a whole population. You're not that powerful. They're getting it done. And these statistics will prove it. See, the American in intimacy crisis is happening now, and our population is starting to plummet just like Japan's is. It's just unspoken, and it's not going to make the controlled headline news because they're not going to tell you what I'm telling you. Here's the statistics of the Japanese intimacy crisis. Half the population aged 16 to 49 had no sex in the past month. 27%, almost 30% of men have claimed, one in three men almost claim they're not interested in sex anymore ever again. Almost a quarter of women, when polled, they're not interested in sex anymore ever again. 20, one quarter, one in four females, no interest in sexual activity. 61% of men age 18 to 34, not in any kind of a relationship, any kind of a romantic relationship with anyone of either gender. Half of women, 18 to 34, not in any kind of a romantic relationship with either gender. 36% of men in that same age group, 18 to 34, are still virgins, have never had sex. 39%, 40% almost of women, age 18 to 34 in the nation of Japan, still virgins, never had sex once, 18 to 34. Now, you look at all those statistics together and you tell me that that's a naturally occurring trend, you're out of your goddamn mind. You tell me that that's not psychological illness, you're out of your goddamn mind. You tell me that's not physiological illness, you're out of your goddamn mind. You tell me that's not social engineering, you're out of your goddamn mind. That's human farming. Human farming is what that is. Get as offended about that as you like, that's what's going on. People should be enraged about something like that, about their ability to call human population numbers like that. You should be enraged about it, because it's coming here now. The rise of asexualism. Asexuals are people who do not experience any sexual attraction to anyone else. Asexualism is characterized by a total disinterest in all sexual behavior. And that's what the human farmers are breeding in Japan and are going to start breeding here in the United States, they've already well, well begun this. Contrary to the claim that asexuality is not a physical and or psychological disorder, that is precisely what it is. This is not a naturally occurring thing in the human genome or in the human population. This is something that is brought about by absolutely demolished testosterone levels in both genders, and it is brought about by mind control social engineering regarding, regarding attitudes about human sexuality. Okay, I liken this, how many people have ever researched the people who think that their, the limbs, their limbs don't belong to them and, and want to remove their limbs? Okay, this is one of the most disturbing things you will ever research. Look up like the phantom limb syndrome or something, and I don't mean like people who have had limbs amputated and think that they're still there. There are people who think my arm doesn't belong to me. My leg doesn't belong to me. I need to get rid of it to feel comfortable in my own skin. Okay? This is an issue. It's a psychological issue going on in the brain that is a, is a profound imbalance in the being, in, the, in, the, in their psychological makeup. Okay? And it's not a normal thing. It, it's a psychological illness. It's a disorder. You know, these people... You know, want it, I'm not saying they're committing any violence or anything like that against anybody or should be discriminated against. But don't try to tell me this isn't a disorder. This is an illness. It's not normal. To look at it as nor normalcy, you're, it's, it's like you're looking at someone who's affected with profound cancer as you're just normal. You're not sick. 
It's an illness, folks. Let's call it what it is. Okay, and it's an example of what social engineering and low testosterone levels in men and women will result in. And it's rising by the day. The sexitus is a term used to describe a movement in which men, largely young men, who have recognized the ubiquitous accept, unacceptable behavior of the conditioned female are quote unquote giving up on women altogether and no longer pursuing any type of relationship with them, romantic or otherwise. I see the so-called sexitus as a reactionary stopgap and a short-term defensive mechanism that are employed by men who realize that there's a profound problem at hand between the genders, but they only recognize the symptoms of that gender war at a skin deep level. And so they're reacting to the symptoms, okay? They have not yet penetrated to the root causal factors that underlie the condition, which is, of course, rampant social engineering that is utilized by the control class. Almost always, when I look up on, let's say, MRA forums or MIGTO forums, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later, or uh, you know, type in the term sexitus and see what people, particularly men, are saying about it, almost zero almost zero of these people ever mention the term social engineering or mind control. Almost zero. It's negligibly talked about, if ever at all, because these people are unaware that a dark priest class that holds occult knowledge about the human psyche is absolutely wreaking havoc on the human population who don't know a goddamn thing about themselves. And it's a piece of cake for them to do. It's, a, it's like a chess master playing an absolute novice who's never looked at a chessboard. You're, they're gonna get their ass kicked hard because they don't have the knowledge to combat these psychopaths who have it. It's, the playing field is not even close to being leveled. It's completely skewed and imbalanced and people aren't even trying to build their way up in the knowledge of themselves to combat these absolute control freaks who were doing this. And they told me they were doing this to a point where I wanted to murder the people in the room who were telling me this to my face. That's how enraged I would get. And I knew if I did anything physical to them that I'd be killed. So I had to shut my mouth and hear what they were saying about what they were doing to the human population. falling birth rates in every westernized country. Human births must be maintained at a 2.1 replacement rate for a population to remain steady. The birth rate in the United States currently stands at 1.86. Now, see, like right there, I know most people don't even understand what those numbers mean because it, there should be an appalling gasp if you understand how low that figure is. And let me tell you something, that's nowhere near where Japan's is at. I don't even have the statistic handy right now, but it's, it's, it's nowhere near 1.8. That's eugenics. Clear and simple. I mean, as clear as a bell in my mind, because I know what these numbers mean. It's at 1.86 and rapidly falling, and people think there's overpopulation. No, human beings are crowded like animals into farms called cities. That's what. There's no overpopulation on this planet. The rate has been in decline. This birth rate in the United States has been in decline year after year, in, not only in the United States, but in every single westernized, industrialized country due to the success of the epigenetics agenda. And I predict that birth rates will continue to fall year over year and the rate at which they will fall will continue to accelerate because what these farmers are doing is they're calling the herd to make it easier to control. Look at, look at these numbers. 1909, 127 births per 1,000 women. 1960, it dropped to 118. 2007, they've over, they've cut it in half within, within, uh, within 100 years. Within a century, cut the birth rate in half. It's gonna take four more generations. The population of every Western culture is gonna be at one quarter of where it is now. 
and then you want to see the control system take off and go into absolute crazed mode, you're going to see what happens when they can more easily control less people. Stands right now at about 63 births per 1,000 women and rapidly declining. One of the biggest parts of the neo-feminism agenda is misandry, the open hatred of men. The accelerating rise of radical neo-feminism is bringing with it open misandry, the overt display of hatred and contempt toward men based solely upon their gender. Misandry is a blatant form of prejudice and unwarranted discrimination that is sadly gaining more societal traction by the day. Men are constantly being portrayed as bumbling idiots in the media and television, more feminists are taking radical, militant stances when it comes to dealing with the opposite sex, even taking this gender war at times into the realm of bitter and hateful attacks upon children. I mean, look at this image that was put on a feminist forum. All the, the things that they wrote on this baby and then photographed, pig, looter, arsonist, runaway, reckless, violent, rioter, criminal, hated, wife beater, sperm bank, dispensable, deadbeat, Risk, alcoholic, thug, rapist, cash point. I mean, you have to be kidding. Writing this on a child, you know? And this isn't a problem going on in society. Let me tell you something. I have directly experienced misandry in my own life. You know, the way that I've been discriminated against has not been racially. You know, a lot of people experience racial division and racism. I could tell you anecdotes about how I have been accused of being a racist, you know, by someone who ha didn't even come close to understanding the symbols that I had on me, you know. Um, I, I can get into that anecdote later, but um, I've experienced the most absolute bias and prejudice against me for being male. It, during the course of my life, it, particularly recently because this agenda is going into full swing. When I, when I interact in society, when I go out socially with people, I do not initiate any force or aggression against anyone else. I'm about the most chill, peaceful guy you're going to come across. When I get up here and I talk about these issues, they fire me up a lot because I have passion talking about uh, the society of death and slavery that is presiding over humanity, maybe that's something that should be upsetting us a little bit more, okay? But you know, when I interact with people, I interact according to the non-aggression principle. I don't bring aggression toward anybody, okay? And yet it continuously finds me when I interact with a lot of people in society or when I even am trying not to interact with people and I consistently see that for some reason the hatred or the aggression is always coming from females. And I don't understand it. I can't personally understand it. The only thing I can conclude is that this is this rise of misandry in society because I look like a masculine man, okay? And it just that air of masculinity is perceived as a threat when I do nothing threatening behavioral wise. I'm sure other men in this room have experienced the same thing. So I see this personally. This isn't something I'm just researching and throwing out there conceptually. I've experienced it in my life. I'm telling you it's real. It's going on. More and more people are seeing it. Another thing that neo-feminism postulates is this notion called toxic masculinity. It seeks to abnormalize and demonize naturally masculine traits and behaviors. This manipulation tactic seeks to equate things like firearms ownership with being violent. See, they're tools of violence, not self-defense. Or a normal healthy interest in sexual activity as sexual aggressiveness, okay? Stripped of all its euphemisms, you know, you, you, you go into this whole catcalling thing that, that went viral on the internet. You know, men saying hi to a woman walk down the street. Oh, that's, this is total abuse and, you know, uh, you know completely uh, 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 infringing on her rights to walk down the street so-called unaccosted when all the men were saying was hello and complimenting her. 
uh, stripped of all its euphemisms, this notion that is called toxic masculinity is just the way for neo-feminists to say that, quote, being a man is a bad thing. That's all it is. Uh, I mean, we should stop sugarcoating it, cut to the chase, start calling it what it really is. It's just the way for them to saying being a man is bad. That's all. You know, I mean, look at, look at, look at this image in the bottom right-hand corner of this slide, I'll go back to it, of what a man is depicted as. A man having sex with a woman is depicted as a demon. A demon. This, is on, this was on a feminist blog that I encountered. Okay? I mean, just imagine that. Saying, all, all, what, men are demons because they find women attractive? A, 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 a nor, totally normal masculine trait? I mean, this is, these are the notions that are being propagated about normal human sexuality in our culture. And it's a real, very real and rising problem, folks. And we better start addressing it now. Because it's getting worse, not better. A couple of anecdotes I have. This, these, are, these are, you know, things that the neo-feminists say that men are doing. You know, man-spreading. How many people have heard of the term man-spreading? Much less than I would have thought, although I'll have to explain what it is to the bulk of people here. Man-spreading is this term that neo-feminists have invented for when men sit on a chair with their, le their legs spread, their thighs spread, because they happen to have these things called testicles. Well, some of them do. You know. Um, you know, like on the subway, they actually have signs on the New York subway, dude, stop the spread, it's a space issue. They can ticket for this in New York City. Cops can give tickets. What do they have, a ruler? They go around with a tape measure? Oh, that's, that's 21 inches, sir. No, that's manspreading. We'll have to issue a citation. I mean, are you absolutely kidding me? I mean, when I, the first time I ever heard of this term, Barb told it to me, okay? She, she, she was like, well, look at the stickers they're putting on the New York trains, the, the subway trains. And I look at it and it goes, stop man spreading. And it has a dude with his legs spread out. I'm like, oh, that's a funny joke. And she's like, no, 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 it's not a joke, that's for real. I'm like, what? I'm like, seriously, that's, that's for real. It's not, they're not just joking around. No, and they're going to start ticketing for it. They have started ticketing for it, okay? Now, see, all this is is to, to, to put the notion out there, men are oppressing women. Men are inconsiderate. You know, it's bad to be a man. They have inconsiderate attitudes. They have aggressive attitudes. You know, it has nothing to do with human anatomy, okay? I'll tell you an anecdote. I'm in a band called The Founders. You might have seen me wearing the shirt earlier. Old school, hardcore punk. Um, but uh, I uh, went with a couple of members, uh, actually two guitarists from my band, uh, DJ and Mike, to uh, see another band play at a local rock club in Philadelphia. And uh, the show ended kind of early. And uh, we were just sitting around uh, we grabbed a couple of beers, and uh, there's a pool table in this club, and we were out near near the exit of the building, sitting on the edge, of, like leaning on the edge of the pool table. Nobody was blocking exits. We're not like, you know, the type of burly guys that are going to go and start trouble with people randomly just to do it. You know, we mind our own business. We were sitting there discussing, you know, things about music and things going on in the world while we were drinking a beer. Probably, there was probably a hundred people in the place and the place started clearing out. So we were in, in, toward the exit. We just were sitting there. I'd say over 70, at least 50 to 75 people walked directly by us and went out the exit. One woman comes toward the exit and jars into my guitarist, Mike, who you know, most people obviously don't know him. You might have seen pictures of him online on our Facebook uh, page for the founders. Mike is probably one of the thinner guys that I know. He's, uh, you know, he's a, he's a tough dude, but he is, 
he's a thin, like, he has a thin frame. You know, he doesn't weigh a whole lot, okay? He um, does not take up that much space, let's put it that way, okay? This guy was not blocking anybody's path by any stretch of any human being's imagination, okay? Um, and as she slams her shoulder into him and almost makes his beer spill, she says, way to man spread, dude. Like really nastily and in a hostile tone of voice, as if he was trying to block her pathway out to the exit. When he wasn't even close to being in anywhere in the aisle, maybe his elbow was, if here was the pool table, and here was the, the, the pathway to go to the exit. His elbow might have been out here like this as he was sipping his beer, okay? So trying to go out of her way to incite hostility, clearly one of these neo-feminists, okay? Not a classical feminist, which is about total equality between the genders in natural rights, okay? Not putting one gender above the other or anybody being in control over anybody else, but neo-feminism is about trying to invoke open hostility and a gender war between men and women. And he responded in his own hostile way, which I took no objection to actually, because if somebody wants to start aggression and bitterness with somebody when there was none, I have no problem with somebody getting up in somebody's face and telling them it's an unacceptable behavior. None whatsoever. So it took me a minute to process what had just happened. I couldn't even believe it. You know, I was like, oh my God, I actually heard somebody use the term manspreading and I had, it, it took me, I had to do a, a triple take. You know, like, what did I just hear? And then I, it even became more absurd because it was Mike and he's, you know, no way could he have possibly been even doing this, okay? So, uh, 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 this is appropriate to the next slide, which is why I'm telling this. When he raised his voice to her, Another guy nearby immediately stepped up like he was going to, you know, come to the damsel in distress's aid because, oh, this, this guy has raised his voice to a woman. How dare he say anything in, a, in, in any kind of a elevated tone to a female? And that's called the white knight, which we're going to talk about on the next slide. And that's when I stood up and just shot the white knight a look. Stay out of it. I didn't even say the words. I just looked at him and my eyes said, stay out of this. And that was it. And he stayed out of it and let them handle it amongst themselves. Okay? Because I have no problem with somebody stepping in and defending someone if, the, if they're truly in the right. No problem. That's called justice. I have no problem with that. Don't come in and step up like you're going to be the big bad guy and defend somebody who's clearly in the wrong. Then I have a big problem with it. And I guess my eyes communicated that to him readily. <laughs> so the other topic is man slamming. Now, this one has directly happened to me on five different occasions. I have experienced this in the streets of South Philadelphia now five times. How many people know what man slamming is? Wow, only a couple of people in the whole room. Okay, I have to explain this one. Neo-feminists postulate this notion that men are completely inconsiderate of the pathway of women as they're walking on the street, okay? And they think, we're just gonna keep going and keep walking and keep moving regardless of where a female happens to be walking and slam into them at every, every opportunity, okay? Now, I don't know about you, but I don't think anybody in this room deliberately walks down the street trying to do things like that, especially none of the men. I know I'm overly considerate when I'm watching people's pathway to see where they're going to walk and try to project that so to avoid a collision, okay? Especially in the streets of South Philadelphia, which can get narrow in some places and busy in some places, okay? Over the last, I'd say, three months, five women have, been wa have walked, and I mean, look, look, I think my perceptions are pretty good. I think I pay attention to my environment pretty well. Okay? And I, I don't think that I invent things that are happening. And for, for the first couple of times, I thought maybe that was happening. Like, am I imagining this? Is this like really happening? Because what they're doing is, it was almost playing a game of chicken with men. 
and trying to make a man deliberately go out of his way to move so as to avoid a collision because they are going to not yield and just come right at a guy to slam into him as hard as possible, okay? Which I don't even understand why you would want to do that to another human being or to yourself. But again, this is out of rampantly out of control ego is what this is. To try to what? Prove a point? What? To say, what do we have to do now? Bow as you pass? Like, and go like that? Shall I curtsy? Shall I wear a skirt and curtsy as you pass? Okay? You know, we can't walk on the right side like traffic does on, the high, on a street or highway and just pass each other politely and cordially anymore? No, apparently we can't due to this gender war. Okay? So, you know, and I, I, this happened a couple of times and I'm thinking, well, maybe it's my imagination. And then, no after it happened a third and a fourth and a fifth time, I'm like, this is a deliberate thing that's being done. They clearly are, have this idea in their head that I'm gonna do this, and it's always young women. It's always women like 20 years old, 21 years old, college age, okay, coming directly out of the social Marxist, communist, communist run schools, which we're gonna talk about that this agenda is an agenda of communism in addition to being an agenda of Satanism. And they're hand in hand, folks. By the way, they got the same high holiday, don't you know? May 1st, Valpurgis Nacht. Okay? That's not an accident. You think May 1st is the high holiday of communism and Satanism by accident? Yeah, keep believing that. So, man slamming, okay? Deliberately walking into a man to try to prove he won't move for you. Now, this happened to me five times, and it was attempted a sixth. <laughs> I carry some solidity. I'm not the tallest guy in the world. I'm not the biggest guy in the world. I have a low center of gravity, though. Ask my martial arts instructor if I'm strong, okay? All I did was shift my weight a tiny bit and stood firm. That person won't be manslamming anybody else because they bounced off of me like a rubber ball. <laughs> and all I did was stand where I was. I didn't try to lay a shoulder in. I didn't raise an arm, you know. I just showed, we want to play that game, we'll play it. And you'll lose, but I'll play, you know. And, you know, we'll see where your ego goes if you fall over into the street, you know. And that's, you know, it's, not a, it's, it's a risky game to play. You know, you fall on concrete, you hit your head, you know, dangerous stuff can result. It, you know, it, it, even... Doing aggressions like that just to prove a point is a stupid, stupid idea, okay? So, um, you know, I just stood my ground on this one time, and when she went bouncing off, I just went, oh, sorry about that, and kept moving on my way. Like as if, you know, oh, that was clearly an accident, right? When we both knew it wasn't. White knights, you know, here, here's the men who come to the damsel in distress's aid regardless of whether she's right or wrong. Like, like I said, no problem coming to someone's aid who's clearly in the right and is be truly being oppressed or being victimized. No problem. But don't come to the aid of somebody just because they're a woman or a man or anybody or a rich or whatever. Just because, you know, uh, you, know you think that they're being somehow oppressed and, and that oppression is, is, you know, actually imagined. That's what white knights do. They jump into battle to make women feel safe against threats that are real or imagined. All right? And, you know, it's a way of trying to garner favor among women. This is done socially in conversation and on online blogs and social media and everything like that. Anybody says anything that, that slightly goes against somebody, and even if they're not even involved in the argument or anything, they want to immediately come to the defense of the woman as if somehow what? They're going to get, you know, all kinds of favors, uh, you know, lavished upon them because they've come to the aid of the damsel in distress. You know, and you're seeing men join the neo-feminist movement in bigger and bigger numbers. 
you know, and, and they don't even understand the distinction between classical feminism and the neo-feminist form of feminism at all. You know, they just want the approval of women who are in this movement to be looked at as cool by them and look, be looked at as on their side. That's all. Part of the reason they do this is because of social ostracism taking place in our culture. Most men, quote unquote men, will refuse to stand up to conditioned women and confront them on both the fallacies they've been conditioned to accept and their associated unacceptable behavior. They do this because they don't want to be socially and sexually ostracized by women because that's another part of the neo-feminist agenda. If you don't agree with my cause or if you don't agree with my take on any given social issue or political issue, well, I don't want to be around you. You're ostracized. You're not welcome to be here. I'm certainly not going to have any interaction with you on any kind of a friendly basis and certainly not on a romantic basis. Okay, so this is done to isolate people and to marginalize people. Adolf Hitler in his book Mein Kampf said, quote, we should allow and encourage women to act as stupid and imaginable as stupid as imaginable, and then denounce men as, quote, faggots and, quote, misogynists if they dare to criticize the woman's stupidity. This is what social ostracism is about. It doesn't matter how radically off basis with reality any female happens to be speaking, the male is not permitted to disagree. You know, and another thing you're, you're hearing more and more of is disagreeal of this kind of social Marxist and neo-feminist political opinions is immediately racist. You're hearing this being used constantly, constantly as a de deflection mechanism from any kind of an argument about the topic. You don't agree with me politically or socially, you're racist, okay? It's bullshit. It's bullshit is what it is. I don't even see race. Race is not even a factor in anything I consider. I've told people from day one, I'm about ending all forms of slavery. Slavery in all of its forms. Okay, that's what my entire philosophy is about. Slavery is inherently illegitimate and it needs to be ended in all of its forms. Okay, and that's, this isn't a eugenics program against any color population. It's a eugenics program against humanity. It's a war on you. That's what this program is. And it's waged through political correctness, politically correct speech. Political correctness is a method of limiting free speech. Many women have been conditioned by the neo-feminist agenda to censor those around them, not to talk about these gender-related issues and other important political issues. Men have been conditioned by the neo-feminism agenda to censor themselves. Self-censorship is being conducted by men because they don't want to be socially ostracized. They fear the risk of being ostracized by most women if they dare to speak out. Well, like I said at the beginning of this presentation, I don't give a damn who likes me. I'm speaking the hard, unpleasant, uncomfortable truth, and I don't care if you like it, and I don't care if you like me. I'm not here to be liked. I'm not here to be your friend. I'm here to speak the truth. That is what I am charged to do, and that's what I'm going to do. MGTO, M-G-T-O-W, standing for Men Going Their Own Way, and MRA, Men's uh, Rights Activism, lacking causal factors and solutions. Men's movements like MGTO or MGTO, Men Going Their Own Way, often portray women as evil, flawed by their nature, and solely responsible for the downfall of humankind. They often push an and divisive belief that the current condition of the female mindset is the result of what they refer to as female nature, when in fact this mindset is a product of complex, lifelong social engineering that affects the vast majority of women and most certainly is not the nature 
of the female of our species, as I'm going to get into in a future slide. Okay? This is the problem with their analysis. They understand the symptoms, but they do not understand social engineering as the causal factor. It's like somebody thinking that all psychopaths are primary psychopaths, and they're just born that way. And they don't understand that there is a condition of psychopathy. The vast majority of psychopaths are not primary genetic psychopaths. They, in fact, are secondary psychopaths that the psycho psychopathy, their inability to feel emotion or to experience human empathy is due to conditions that occurred to them during their lives, past traumas that they experienced. Well, social engineering is a form of mass trauma that's taking place against the psyche of the female of our species, okay? And it is the reason that these behaviors manifest themselves. It is not there, that way from birth. If this hidden hand of the social engineers were not continuously repressing true human female nature, the, the inauthentic women would not be behaving the way that they do in our society. We have to understand that. You start blaming it on women as a species, as just, you know, the, the, the gender. We're getting further down the line of the gender war and divisiveness between the genders. You're not working toward healing the divide. And you're, you're actually missing. You're, you're thinking from an absolute flawed, axiomatic point of view. Because you haven't actually done enough homework to understand how this is being done. I told you, when I go on MGTOW or MRA forums, it's almost a, an absolute, it, it's almost negligible when they are talking about any forms of social engineering. And the term mind control just never comes up. Because they will, the, if they do ever talk about it, they'll talk about the influence, societal influences. That's the euphemism they'll use. They won't call it mind control, which is what it really is. Okay? They have no knowledge of it because they have no knowledge of the occult. Zero. These people have no knowledge about how occult knowledge can be wielded to affect the mind of someone else. None. And that's the problem with these movements. They're correct in their analysis, incorrect in their causal factor analysis, and incorrect certainly in their solutions. Men's reaction movements such as MGTOW and MRA, men's rights activism, like many other activist groups, will often correctly analyze the symptoms of the problem, but do not have an accurate understanding of the causal factors of the problem, and therefore also lack any true empowering long-term solutions. A quote-unquote solution often presented by many in these reactionary movements is for men to completely, quote, drop out of human society or to no longer have any interaction whatsoever with women unless they are receiving some sort of overt benefit for the interaction. Those within these movements should not expect any improvement in the conditions which they analyze until and unless the main causal factor of social engineering or mind control is recognized and addressed by them. And that's why the, the idea to drop out and stop interacting with women is not a solution. The solution isn't about not interacting with women, it's about explaining what the hell has been being done to women to them. That's the solution. And you know what? Most men want no part of that work, and most women don't want to hear it. That's the truth of that. And you know what? It doesn't matter. I'm going to keep speaking it anyway. It doesn't make a difference who's listening. Because that's the right thing to do. I don't do this because I even expect anything to change. I don't do this because I care about specific people. I do this because I care about truth. And I care about freedom, and I'm going to try to influence it for greater freedom. I'm going to try to influence society to move toward greater truth and greater consciousness. It doesn't even make a difference if the effect happens long term or not. I'm doing it because this is what I'm here to do. This is how I'm investing the time in my life. And most of all, because it's right. So I see things a little differently than even the MGTOW community does, okay? The blue pill, you know, the, the traditional blue pill path, and then you have the red pill path, which is what the, the, the arrow jutting off that symbol is. Well, I think really, you know, the truth is in an entirely different direction from both. So that is the um, end of the manipulation section. Now let's get into the solutions that I'm going to present here today.
<clears throat> I call this section the rebirth of the goddess. Solutions, the, the alternative title for this section, not, it's not only called the rebirth of the goddess, but these are the solutions for healing the gender divide. The first thing we have to understand that when we're talking with people about this, many people have been conditioned to believe these things or to accept these, these methods of manipulation and mind control their entire lives. So change is very difficult. What we're really up against is religion. If you haven't figured that out yet, folks, I don't know what to tell you, okay? These beliefs are religious beliefs. They comprise a religious belief system in these people's minds. Religious beliefs are constantly programmed into the psycho psychology of a person, particularly into the subconscious mind, never to be questioned, okay? Just like the belief in authority, just like the belief in money, just like the belief in cultural religions. It's anathema and heresy to question these religiously entrenched beliefs. So, you know, you see this politician asking people, who wants change? And everybody has their hand raised like, oh, give me some of that change. And then he says, who wants to change? And then everybody's just like this. Hands down, heads down, like, no, not me. I'm fine the way I am. No problem here. Nothing required on my part to do or to change within myself. You know, I don't want any part of that activity. There are two primary choices in life. To accept conditions as they exist or to accept the responsibility for changing them. And that's what you have to ask yourself, ladies and gentlemen. Which side of that coin are you on? Either you're an agent who is trying to influence change, or you are a person who's just accepted the default conditions as the status quo. Why is change difficult? Why specifically is change so difficult? And I'm going to go to the words of um, the, one of the uh, doctors who I told you to research in the epigenetics section of this presentation, Dr. Joe Dispenza. Why is change difficult? Most people spend a great deal of their day unconsciously feeling and thinking from past memories. They do this because they have hardwired those experiences by repeatedly thinking of them and by associating many other experiences with them. Now, what did we say epigenetics was? Epigenetics was changes in the physiology and the psychology due to changes in consciousness. So if you are constantly wiring your brain to think a certain way, there's a very good chance it's going to continue to think that way because that's its comfort zone. And you're, you're chemically rewiring it to continue along that patterns and those pathways. It makes sense that if most people maintain the same environment for long periods of their lives where nothing new is happening, where there is no change, the repeated stimuli will therefore produce the reactivation of associative neural networks, which will become more developed, strengthened, and refined. As a consequence of that lack of novelty in their environments and experiences, they have become hardwired to their own worlds. No wonder change is so difficult. Ladies and gentlemen, you gotta look into the work of Dr. Joe Dispenza, it's amazing. Initiation, the beginning of the spiritual journey. Okay, so change, yes, we recognize fully change is difficult, but you have to start. Just saying, oh, it's too difficult, so I'm not gonna start, you're never gonna go anywhere. You have to begin the spiritual journey somewhere. That's what the word initiation means. It means to begin, to start. The dark occultists that I work with, the Satanists in the grottos that I was a member of for brief periods of time, they had a phrase that they called the human herd. They called us the unbegun. It's the most esoteric term I've ever heard applied to the, the bulk of the human, uh, the masses of humanity. The unbegun. Because they said they don't even understand what initiation is. They don't even understand beginning a journey in consciousness at all. 
They haven't started in any place. Not even one place have they begun. And so they call them the unbegun. The other thing they call them is the dead. They refer to human beings as the dead because they say there is no activation in thought, emotion, or action within the population. And therefore, since those are the three main expressions of human consciousness, and they are all essentially deadened, that for all intents and purposes, they are a just animated clump of matter that actually contains no life, and therefore they call us the dead. And they absolve themselves of their immoral behaviors toward the population because they say, we're not doing that to any living entities, they're already dead. Literally call us the dead. It is no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. So if you're one of the people who may be out there watching some of these manipulation tactics and all the aspects of the neo-feminist agenda, and you're saying, I have no problem with that, you're part of the problem yourself. You should be horrified by the manipulation tactics and statistics and agendas that I talked about in the problems section of this presentation. And you should begin to make the realization that they are real and happening. And if not, you need to do a lot of research on your own. And you need to do a lot more social interaction on your own among people who are not in your normal social circles so you get a more rounded and eclectic view of what's really going on. That's a big problem for most people. They tend to hang out in their own little circles around people who are just like them, and they think everybody's like this. Nonsense. Come with me and let's hang in Philadelphia one day. I'll take you to some places where you, you'll see some of the lowest consciousness you ever imagined. You know? And those aren't even the worst places. So you have to recognize that the problem is real and it's as bad as it is. I'm telling you, it's probably worse than what I've explained. One of the great um, French uh, uh, spiritual philosophers, Henri Bergson, said, fortunately, some are born with spiritual immune systems that sooner or later give rejection to the illusory worldview grafted upon them from birth through societal conditioning. Now, here's a spiritual philosopher, or who you might call an occultist, who knows what the hell he's talking about, okay? They begin sensing that something is amiss and start looking for answers. Inner knowledge and an anomalous outer knowledge and, an anom anom and anomalous outer experiences show them a side of reality others are oblivious to. And so begins their journey of awakening. Each step of the journey is made by following the heart instead of following the crowd and by choosing knowledge over the veils of ignorance. <laughs> One of the greatest quotes I've ever found, okay? <laughs> Eastern philosopher said, enlightenment is a destructive process it has nothing to do with becoming better or being happier. Enlightenment is the crumbling away of untruth. As a matter of fact, folks, it won't make you very happy. It'll make you pretty well pissed off if you're fully enlightened about what's really going on. You will become enraged rather quickly if you have a sense of justice and conscience. It is seeing through the facade of pretense it is the complete eradication of everything we imagined to be true. And here's one of the biggest things human beings need to understand, okay? I know this was the top, one of the big topics of Jay Parker's talk yesterday. As soon, let me tell you something. As soon as someone starts talking about human nature to me, I realize they're a complete moron. Okay, I, so, I, I get as offended about that as you like. Okay, as soon as someone mentions the term, oh, that's human nature, you're a moron. You don't know what the hell you're talking about at all. Okay, and I don't even, I don't even need to qualify that. I'm just making that statement. Okay, making that statement. 
There is no such thing as human nature, folks. There is no such thing. Actually, there is such a thing, but it's so negligible, okay, that it's, it's, barely, even, it's barely even worth attributing any of that to why we do the behaviors that we do. That's like saying, you know, I take this computer and I take an identical computer and put it next to, next to each other, okay, and we're gonna ask, what is the nature of this computer, of these two computers? Is one good and is one evil? Is one flawed and is one okay? Well, hey, there could be hardware problems. Let's just let's say they've all been con you know, quality controlled, they have the exact same specs, they're working perfectly to perform, the, 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 the hardware is working perfectly. Two identical machines. What's the nature of those computing machines? To compute data, to take data in through input, to process it in the processor, okay? And then to put it out through some type of output device. That's the nature of a computer. That's what you do with a computer. What determines whether the computer performs efficiently or not, okay? What are the qualities of, that the computer has to have to, to, to work efficiently? It's gotta have a good file system format on the hard disk drive. It's gotta have an operating system that is functioning properly and doesn't have a lot of bugs. It has to have good software programs that you could put data through and transform data with. And then it has to have good output devices to put the, the data that you're processing and reworking out onto the screen or on the internet or onto a printer or something, okay? So, the nature of a computer is that it computes information. That's all it does. Well, what is the nature of a human being? It's very similar to the nature of a computer. Not to say the human beings are computers, because they are not computers. They're not just biological computers. But we have a similar nature to a computer in that we take information into ourselves, we process it, we weed it out for inconsistencies, and then we act upon it in society. This is the trivium method, this is the trivium process. Input, processing, and output, okay? So, human beings, their actual nature is, like a computer, they are a programmable species. The nature of a human being is that a human being can be programmed to behave in a certain way. That's our nature. This is what parenting is ultimately all about, okay? You program into a child, parenting and education. You program into a child be behavioral input data. It's processed in the mind, in the psyche of the child, and then they display the behavior on the screen of life. That's the output called human behavior. Human beings are programmable like computers. Like a computer, if a human being has a bad file system format. This is all the conditioning and all the data that a, a, a human child takes in during the formative years or the format years. You're laying the format down of the child's mind, okay? If it has a bad operating system, well, what's our operating system? Our operating system is our culture that we're operating in, our society. If that's already fouled and polluted and really messed up, and people's brains are badly damaged and their behavior is really bad, you're already operating at a disadvantage because you, your operating system that you're working in is already totally screwed up, okay? And if there's, there, they have bad software programs, if they've been given bad software programs full of bugs, okay? That's the, that's the um, rigid and, and erroneous and dogmatic beliefs that people have con been conditioned to accept through social engineering, in other words, that's religion. That's false religion, let me qualify it by saying, okay? If you have all of those qualities in place, well, what do you think's gonna happen? You think the person's gonna be a well-adjusted person? You think they're gonna really have a lot of knowledge? They're gonna be a person who really behaves properly toward other people, who wants to uplift consciousness, who wants to uplift themselves and others? Good luck, good luck with that. You ain't ever gonna get that in those conditions. Never, can't happen. Not only won't it happen, not possible to happen. Okay, the, if you have all of those things, the file format, which is the, the formative programming of the child, the operating system, and the software programs, meaning horrible belief system in place, you're gonna get bad output on the screen or on the internet or on the printer, and those output devices are called human life. 
Don't expect any good output on those devices, on that device called life. You're not going to get it. You're going to get junk output, garbage. So if, you know, it, and once that's bad for multiple people, it, it collects, it, it grows in the aggregate sense. And then you have deteriorating conditions in the aggregate scale, the mass scale of humanity. Like a computer, the behavior of a human being will largely depend upon its programming or parenting, okay, or raising of the child. So then the question has to become, well, who's doing that programming? Are people who actually care about the being and want to strengthen it and uplift it in consciousness doing that programming? Or are people who want to make its mind mush so that that being is a good slave doing that programming? I'll tell you who's been doing it. And it ain't good parents. Because if we had good parents in this world, this shit wouldn't be going on. The quality of the behavior that a human being outputs onto the screen of life is going to be largely dependent upon its pro the programming that that being receives. And that programming means the quality of the information that that being is receiving, which enables it to process and create effectively, to understand its environment and to create its environment in a way that is be bettering and uplifting for itself and everyone around it. Okay? Now, that means all of the information coming in. That means food, air, water, and actual what we think of as information, as data about things going on in the world. All of that has to be pure and non-polluted, okay? Or you're gonna get errors in the biological system, errors in the, the, the psychological system, okay? If garbage goes into a human being, garbage comes out of the human being. If quality information and quality nutrients and, and, and quality energy goes into a human being, quality comes out of the human being. And they put out into the world good positive energy. So what are, if the world is the way that it is, by absolute definition, what do we have to be programming our children with? Quality or garbage? Garbage. Largely. Or the world could not be the way it is. It could not manifest itself the way that it is. So, you know, that's the hard truth. That's what human nature is, folks. Not just one, one way, oh, it's good or bad, or this is just the nature of how people behave. They're always just gonna be programmed by their genetics to behave that way and there's nothing they could do about it. Nonsense. We have free will choice. We exist in a free will universe. You always have a choice. You're not controlled by your genes. Consciousness precedes gene expression. You change the way you think and believe, you can, you can change the manifested result in the so-called external domain called the world. Yeah. My next solution, beside, the first thing is you have to understand what human nature really is and get this absolute bullshit notion of, of Darwinian scientism, so-called survival of the fittest, nonsense form of evolution out of your mind when it comes to what human nature is or why people behave the way that they do. And if you believe that shit, you're under total mind control, folks. I don't know how, how else more plainly I could put it. It's nonsense. It's a, it's a so-called theory that didn't even hold up to its own expectations through evidence in the fossil record, okay? And people need to stop accepting it as law because it has nothing to do with law. Human beings don't just behave a certain way by, by nature. They, they learn their behaviors. This, this whole argument of nature versus nur nurture is a crock of shit that has to be put to rest. It's almost all nurture. It's almost all what we're being taught or not taught by the generations that came before us and our own parents and our teachers, so-called teachers and so-called leaders that are supposed to care about us in society and don't give a damn. They're programming us with garbage and we're expecting quality output in life. Doesn't work that way. Never gonna work that way. The next solution, understand who directs this agenda. And believe me, it is being directed by these groups and individuals. I don't, you don't have to believe me. 
dig your own, hey, it's your own funeral. You know what I'm saying? And people listening out there who are not in the room, I know the people in the room have a much more open-minded attitude about this. People out there listening, yeah, re refuse to understand and look into the, these agendas put forward by all these groups I'm going to talk about. It's your funeral. Because believe me, they're working on it. And they're getting it done already. The first group you got to look into is the Tavistock Institute of Human Relations. If you don't understand Tavistock, who is involved in it, what it does, what it puts out there, you're missing an entire part of the entire mind control agenda of the world. Because these are where the social engineers gather and formulate their plans. Okay? The book by John Coleman is indispensable reading. Anybody who has not read this book, it's unacceptable. You need to read the book, The Tavistock Institute of Human Relations, to understand this mind control think tank. Another group you got to look into, he's all, uh, Coleman has also wrote a book on this group. It's called the Club of Rome. Directly connected with the Vatican, directly absolutely responsible for the implementation of the population control or eugenics agenda on this planet. Okay? And I'm telling you, it's interconnected with the religious agenda for population control. Because, trust me, these ostensible front religious groups, the big three religions especially, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, okay, are directly infiltrated and are being run by the dark occult groups. As a matter of fact, these religions were created by dark occultists, okay? You got to look up the Club of Rome. When I was involved in Satanism, this is the organization that was continuously just, just dropped. The name was dropped over and over again of some of the people who were higher up than me in the hierarchy saying, we think we're from just understanding a little bit about your qualities and your personality, we might want to try to get you involved with. Now, of course, I never went into that involvement, but that's what was suggested because they felt I had the mindset for being involved in a eugenics agenda. And you know what? I did. And you know what? I still do. How's that? You want a shocking revelation for Free Your Mind 4? I am a eugenicist. A true eugenicist, not a dysgenicist. See, what a real eugenicist wants is for the, it wants good breeding. That's all the word eugenics means. It means I want people to be bred upward in society toward higher states of awareness and higher states of consciousness. The prefix or the, the, the noun, I'm sorry, the adjective you uh, epsilon, upsilon, uh, epsilon, upsilon in Greek, pronounced you, is the adjective meaning good. And then genos is the other part of, epi, uh, I'm sorry, of eugenics. Genos means race or stock or breed. So it just means creating a better breed of person. That's all it means. Okay, so I truly want eugenics. I don't want dysgenics. As we said yesterday, you can't really call the social engineers of the world eugenicists. They're not trying to breed humanity for the better. They're trying to breed, downbreed us so that we call ourselves and help them call us. That's dysgenics. That has nothing to do with good breeding. That's bad breeding. So, you know, they thought that I would be suited to help them in their work of dysgenics when I was involved in Satanism because they saw a certain characteristic skill set within me that they wanted to exploit, okay? And see, that's the thing. I did understand what so-called eugenics, what, what it really is, is dysgenics. I understood it. They knew I had a grasp of what it really was and how it worked. That's why they wanted to bring me involved in that agenda, okay? It's part of like understanding a psychopath. You, you can't really deeply understand the level of evil that's going on in the world unless you can put your mind into that mindset. This is part of the problem, folks. People can't envision evil. They can't envision a psychopathic mind state. That's a bad thing not to be able to do that. People will think, oh, why would I want to try to imagine that or put myself in that position? You can't, if you can't visualize that level of evil, you can't understand how it's operating. You can't visualize how someone would want to control a whole population. It's hard for you to even grasp that this is being done because you can't even conceive of the mindset of the people who are doing it. It's almost too fantastical for the mind to accept. 
And people would think, oh, that's a great thing. That means I'm not ever in these bad, horrible mindsets thinking like this. No, it's not. It's not, a, it's not a good thing. It's a very bad thing that people can't think like that. You have to have the ability to shift your mind into that almost psychopathic mindset. It's something I, called, I call having the psychopath. If you don't have that aspect to your personality, you can't understand the level of evil that we're up against, let alone fight it. Not possible without having that dark and shadow side to yourself. Not possible. Other groups, intelligence agencies, abound in this agenda, particularly the United States Central Intelligence. The Council on Foreign Relations, a think tank that directs political operations in conjunction with the eugenics agenda. The United Nations, another uh, worldwide political organization that is directly involved with uh, you know, um, eugenics operations and you know, supports things like, um, you know, population control. The Rockefeller Foundation, responsible for a lot of the pharmaceutical aspects of the eugenics agenda. The Bilderberg Group, again, setting international policy amongst many different countries regarding this agenda, this very small cabal of uh, uh, international uh, 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 financial leaders, political leaders, leaders in uh, science, uh, everything. Um, the Fabian Socialists, what that uh, shield represents, uh, their logo is a wolf in sheep's clothing. Fabian Socialism is also known as incremental socialism. It is the form of politics that we have operating here in the United States right now. Fabian Socialism. It means that you're going to march through the institutions to get done what you want to get done politically. You're not going to try to conquer a nation militarily uh, and wage a military revolution, you're going to do it through a cultural revolution, as we will talk about. That means you're doing the totalitarian tiptoe toward full communism. And that's what the Fabian Society is, is uh, actively involved in progressing through cultural Marxist uh, promulgation in the United States. Oh, and again, as we're going to see, this is a direct communist plan. This is a communist agenda, folks, to weaken the entire fabric, the, the, the main essence that strengthens the fabric of a culture, which is the familial bond between man and woman, that is one of the main overarching methods of attack that communists have used in every country they've ever taken over. And they are well entrenched in the United States, and they're getting it done. They are a cohesive unit operating through mainly the public school system. Organized religion, every so-called cultural religion out there, ultimately behind the scenes, is actively involved in the dysgenics agenda and the population control agenda. This is what these r r absolutely ridiculously outnoted dations of outnoted um, ideas about human sexuality are all about. Okay, they're putting out these ancient views of human sexuality that are all about repression of the natural uh, sexual dynamic and energy between men and women. And that's a deliberate part of the agenda. So you think that all these religions are separate. They're not. They're all working behind the scenes on the same accord. Okay, it's like, it's like just like politics. You know, except we think we have a three-party system here instead of a two-party system, all right? It's all the same people behind the scenes. It's directed by the dark occult agenda, the eugenics agenda, and th these are just fronts for those groups. You have to understand that. So many people are attached to their religion. They think their religion is right and all the other religions are wrong. They're all invented to divide humanity. They're all invented to give people a rigid belief system so that they don't understand what's really being done. They all have a seed of truth within them or most people wouldn't buy into them. So at the core, yeah, there's a seed of truth. But, you know, all the other trappings and laws and rituals and all that other stuff is just there to throw you off the path of truth, you know, and get you into a, put you into a box and say, you shouldn't consider anything outside of this box. Here's the real religionists that lie behind the so-called cultural religions. It's all invented by the same people, folks, and it has been run by these people for tens of thousands of years, okay? This is the main bulk of my work and what I talk about, the dark occult. The, the priest class that's really running the show. You don't know any of their names and neither do I. Okay? It doesn't matter what their names are. You know, they come and go. 
they jump in and out. You know, one leaves this plane, another one comes right in and takes its place. That's how it works. Let me tell you something, it ain't all men, it ain't all white people, it ain't all Jews, it ain't all Freemasons, it's an eclectic worldwide variety of human beings in every walk of life, and I'm telling you, there's probably some sitting in the room. Just a quick, real quick anecdote. I amazingly synchronistically in my life passed on the streets of Philadelphia two Satanists in the last couple of months that I worked within the Satanic institutions when I was actively involved. I passed by two Satanists on the street within the last couple of months. They didn't see me as I passed them because I was in a car both times. And I'm telling you, if I passed by two people that I personally recognized from my involvement, I am guaranteeing you they are all around us. They're, my attitude is starting to be readjusted about the numbers of these people. The numbers are bigger than I think I had previously imagined. Because if, if that kind of frequency can happen, I guarantee you there's so many you have absolutely no idea. So it, it's, it, this is something, th this religion is ancient. You have to understand, these people have been breeding on the earth for a long time. And they've been performing these eugenics operations for a long time. I'm not trying to make them sound all powerful and that we can't stop them, but I'm just trying to let, help you to understand. You have to really understand who's running this show. We don't live in a matriarchy. We don't live in a patriarchy. All myths, neither one of those things exists or has existed. Contrary to neo-feminist propaganda, we do not live in a patriarchy, nor do we live in a matriarchy just because women have been conditioned to condition men and to influence them to obey the control system. That doesn't mean we live in a, patri in a matriarchy, okay? We do, however, live in what I refer to as an occultocracy, a society that is ruled covertly by a hidden priest class of dark occultists who use their advanced knowledge of the human psyche to mind control the overwhelming majority of the ignorant human population. The occultocracy comprise a small subset of humanity who believe that they are super worthy and that they are on their way to becoming gods on earth. Out of control, ego and selfishness is the essence of their satanic religion. They have inculcated us with their own ego-driven belief system, which has replaced our traditional moral values and has become pervasively entrenched in our culture. That's the problem, folks. The problem isn't that there's a subset of Satanists running the world. The problem is they've given the bulk of humanity their psychopathic mindset. That's the problem. And until we break the bonds of that psychopathic mindset, don't expect freedom, don't expect positive change, don't expect anything but more death. That's what this cult is about, and that's what they're going to give us till we wise up. You have no choice. You have owners. Probably the greatest politically oriented comedian ever, George Carlin. Neo-feminism is at its core a communist and satanic agenda. First, and, and, and not necessarily foremost, but first I'm going to talk about how it's a communist agenda. Socialists and outright communists have long ago taken over the school system in America. The public school system and the university school system. Communism infiltrates the educational system throughout our country and has slowly, over the last few generations, culturally taken over the minds of the young. I'm telling you, the younger generations of, of this species are the absolute most mentally enslaved generations that have ever been born. It's sad, it's a sad, sad, sad thing. And it's a testament, it's a testimony to how well this enslavement agenda is proceeding and working through the school system. If anybody within the sound of my voice 
Get your children out of public schools and homeschool them. Their minds are being destroyed, destroyed in the public school system. They are being blatantly programmed to accept communism. All 10 planks of the Communist Manifesto are in place in America. Not one, not three, not five, not seven, all 10. Do the research and understand what the actual tenets of communism are and you'll see all of them are in place. This makes this nation a de facto communist regime. And sadly, most people in America cannot even define what communism is. They don't even understand it's the takeover of the means of production by the state. They don't understand it's a system of enslavement. They think it's a worker's paradise. Absolute bullshit propaganda put out by dark occultists. That's all. They want people to think it's, it's, it's an absolute paradise to be a working slave for the party members at the top who are an occultocracy. The cultural Marxist plan to wage a covert war on America through a long march through the institutions was formulated by the Frankfurt School think tank under the direction of Italian communist Antonio Gramsci. And if you don't know who this guy is, you better get online and start typing his name in some search engine and reading all about it. Because he's probably one of the biggest cultural influences in this country and nobody even knows his damn name. Realizing America could not be conquered easily from without, Gramsci's plan was to weaken it over time by infiltrating its institutions and creating socially divisive issues and strategies. This would produce the long-term effect of dividing the genders and destroying the familial dynamic, the familial bonds between man and woman in society. You have to weaken those bonds to weaken the society at a core level. This would pave the way for the takeover by the party. And it ain't gonna look like that party there. It's more gonna look like political gulags and concentration camps and starvation of mass numbers of people, like it always does in this failed bullshit system that people still think is so idealistic and desirable. If you think that way, you got your head up your ass. Here's some quotes from communists. V.I. Lenin said, give me four years to teach the children and the seed I have sown will never be uprooted. Yeah, that's called the university system. Nikita Khrushchev, who told America that, they, that communists would silently bury us and that our children would wake up and the country would all be communist already. And you know what? He wasn't lying, he was telling the truth, this sick, depraved occultist. They're getting it done. Because we're not on the same page yet. We're still not on the same page. It's, mid it's almost mid-2016. Humanity still ain't on the same page about what's going on. Their head's still in their television and their mouths are still full of GMO food. Your children's children will live under communism. You Americans are so gullible. No, you won't accept communism outright, but we'll keep feeding you small doses of socialism until you will finally wake up and find that you already have communism. We won't have to fight you. We'll so weaken your economy until you fall like overripe fruit into our hands. Yeah, that's not happening. Don't worry about it. America, Joseph Stalin. America is like a healthy body and its resistance is threefold. It's patriotism, it's morality, and it's spiritual life. And I would suggest he's talking about the real patriotism, not the absolute nonsense kind of thinking that your country can never do any wrong. He's talking about patriots like me. That's the kind of patriots he's talking about. And you know what? He's absolutely right about that first part of the statement. That is America's immune system and it's slowly growing. If we can undermine these three areas of true patriotism, morality, and spiritual life, we will, America will collapse from within. Don't worry about it. It's not part of the plan. It's not happening. 
When we get ready to take the United States, we will not take it under the level of communism. We will not take it under the label of socialism. These labels are unpleasant to the American people and have been speared too much. We will take the United States under the labels we have made very lovable. We will take it under liberalism, progressivism, under democracy, but take it we will. Alexander Trachtenberg at the National Convention of Communist Parties, 1944. They've been busy, but you know, don't worry about it because there's no communist plan to take over America. It's not happening. Neo-feminism is at its core a satanic agenda, which we've already somewhat talked about. But I want to even offer total proof of this. And they're very blatant. Believe me, one thing I'll tell you about Satanists when they talk amongst themselves or to people who they're you know, directly outreaching to openly, they're very candid about what they are doing. They are so 100%, this is maybe their only possible chink in their armor, is that they have such overabundance of confidence, they may underestimate humanity's fighting spirit. Okay, that's a hope that I have, okay? But I'm telling you, they talk very candidly and openly amongst themselves and are very blatant about what they are doing, as if, yeah, we're doing this, who's gonna stop us? Not a damn person. That is how they talk. Okay, and you'll see what I'm talking about here in this quote I'm about to read. Eugenics is one of the four main tenets of the satanic ideology, along with moral rel selfishness, moral relativism, and social Darwinism. One of this religion's significant books, The Satanic Witch, is a manual on how to manipulate men to bring them to the selfish bidding of a crafty woman. It reads like a diary of modern neo-feminist, of the modern neo-feminist female. Quote from Zena LaVey, Anton LaVey, who wrote the book, The Satanic Witch, which is a field manual for how women can completely manipulate and dominate men to bring them to their bidding to do whatever they want or to give them whatever resources that they want for their own selfish purposes. Zena was uh, Anton LaVey's daughter at the time. She wrote the introduction to the book, The Satanic Witch. I believe it's first and second printings. And here's her quote on page two of The Satanic Witch. The Satanic Witch, among many other things, is a guide to selective breeding, a manual for eugenics. Wow. Right on the second page of the introduction to the book, very candidly and openly admitting, this is what it is, this is what we are doing. Because they know most people are never going to read this thing. Okay? Because you're going to see, oh, that's all about Satanism, and I don't want to fill my mind with that. Well, if you haven't read the Satanic Bible, it's totally unacceptable. If you haven't read the Satanic Witch, it's totally unacceptable. Because you don't know the mindset of your owners. That's why. They're giving you their, their playbook out in the open because they're so sure you're not even going to be interested in what they're telling you they're going to do. See, this image I wanted to throw into the presentation because it represents, the, it's a perfect representation of that unholy feminine energy that I'm talking about, the destruction of the sacred feminine. You know, in biblical allegory, this is the Lilith energy. That's what we're talking about here, okay? This isn't about the, the nature of the female. This is about the absolutely egoic, mind-controlled state to want to be God, to want to control that the feminine essence can be twisted into, okay? That's the Lilith energy. That's what we're talking about here, okay? This agenda at its core is based upon that unholy energy. You know, I, it's just a name, folks. So I don't believe in it as an, an actual embodied deity or anything like that. It's a conceptual idea that represents aspects of ourselves that could go completely rotten and perverted. So, the solution is to awaken the sacred feminine energy, the Eve energy, if you will, the Sophia energy. That's what needs to be awakened. Wisdom, true wisdom, care for truth, okay? The heart.
based intelligence, a desire for justice and morality and natural law, and true equality under rights, which is what the ancient goddesses symbolically and allegorically represented in every ancient mystical tradition and every ancient wisdom tradition. We have to embody both men and women the lost principle, care for truth. The lost principle is the dynamic of care. What we care about on a day-to-day -day basis acts as the driving force of our thoughts and actions. Therefore, care can be seen as the ultimate generator of the quality of our experience. This principle has often been referred to as the generative principle, the sacred feminine creative principle. The word generative comes from the Latin verb genere, which means to make or to create. It is the motherly, womb-like energy, the nurturing creative energy that we all have within us, both male and female. This is not about gender. This is, this is the principle of mental gender or spiritual gender. All beings, regardless of their physical gender, carry these qualities, both masculine and feminine, within us. Most people, however, don't care about the truth. They only care about what works in their favor, no matter how unfair and inhumane those conditions happen to be, or what the result of their getting happens to come from inhumane and unfair conditions. And you know what that ideology is called, ladies and gentlemen? Re Thank you, repeat it after me, Satanism. That's what that ideology is called, okay? That's what Satanism really is. It's not worshiping some devil entity. It's saying, I'm God, I'm the only one who matters. I don't give a damn about what's happening to my fellow human being. And as long as it's working out in my favor and to my comfort, screw everybody else. That's how people think you're a Satanist. And let me tell you something, the vast amount of, the, the overwhelming bulk of humanity are Satanists. They're not Satanists who are in the know, in the dark occult, who are actively directing this agenda, but they are Satanists nonetheless. They're de facto Satanists in their mind, in their emotions, and in their behavior. And that's where it really counts. And that conditioning leading to that, the, the, the living of that type of a lifestyle is what's keeping the world a prison. And until that mindset goes, we free ourselves of that Satanic mindset, expect to live in a prison. Hell. Hell, exactly, that's correct. What we care enough to put our will behind is ultimately what will get created in our world, what we will manifest in our world. The world is the way that it is because most people do not care enough, even if they say they want change and they say they want things to be different, to change it through their actions. And people, hate when I say this, because they're like, well, what you're saying is more people really ultimately want it that way. Yeah, it doesn't matter what you say you want. It matters what you do, ultimately, about, see, that's the whole thing. There's a, one choice or another. You accept it to stay the way it is, or you actually take action to change it. And if you're not actively involved in that process, again, you're part of the problem, and you're helping things stay the way it is, whether you say you want it to change or not. That's what the principle of care is about. You have to care enough to get up and do something about it. And that means speaking to other people. That means it doesn't matter how uncomfortable or how crazy, how uncomfortable the situation may get or how crazy you may be perceived by other people. It doesn't make a damn bit of difference. You gotta speak it anyway. See, and part of that process, part of this healing process, because all of this is ultimately about the lack of true self-esteem. That's where all of this desire to control comes from. It comes from people who are ultimately inwardly self-loathing. So all fear, all this fear, it's, that's where it's pr produced from. Okay, thank you. It's, it's a self-loathing mentality. Somebody who truly loves themselves doesn't want to try to control other people, folks. It's real simple. You truly love yourself at a deep, fundamental, core, spiritual level, you're not trying to control the behavior of anybody else. I'm not interested in being anybody's leader or master or ruler, you know? Now, I, I'm uncomfortable even try, trying to be a teacher of this information because I don't really want to do this. I don't want to do this with my time. 
I'm going to continue to do it because I know I have the moral responsibility knowing what I know to continue to do it. This isn't how I want to spend my time. You know? I want to go ride my bike. I want to do martial arts. I want to make smoothies and juice. Get my health in even better shape than it is. You know? I want to play music. That's what I really want to be doing with my time. You know? I want to go see other bands play. I enjoy creating. I want to get better at art. You know, and creative endeavors. This isn't what I want to, want to do. You think this is what I want to do? You've got to be on really, really, really bad drugs. <laughs> Keep them away from me if that's what you think. The word respect is derived from the Latin prefix re, meaning again, and the Latin verb spectare, meaning to look at. True respect means that you have to do the internal shadow work and take another look at yourself, your own attitudes, your own emotions, your own behaviors. And that's one of the hardest things for hu any human being to do. To ask the question, who am I? And do I truly like myself? You know? You want to talk about the real hard work. That's harder. That you got to do that first before you get involved in the great work. You know? That's the hardest work there is to do. That's the long, treacherous, dark night of the soul. You know, where I almost lost my self, the connection to my higher self and went into such depressed states that I contemplated suicide and, you know, uh, just wanted to just not be alive anymore. You know, that's, that's where that dark process will happen. But once you go through it, I guarantee you, you do that shadow work, you'll emerge out the other side transformed. Another solution is the non-support of all order followers and dominators by women. Women need to step into their empowering roles as influencers of human morality, which they very much could be again. One of the most significant ways they can do this is to draw a line in the sand by refusing to support in any way men who are employed as order followers. Any man accepting a job in which they engage in the initiation of violence and coercion should be encouraged by women to quit that immoral job and to find a moral one. This is called the concept in Eastern thought of right livelihood. And so many women are completely complacent in this regard, regardless of where the money that the man is, is making that money from, they're just happy to have that income coming in as long as it's going to provide some kind of comfort level for their quality of life. And I'm telling you, that's one of the biggest problems in all of this society. And that's what women have to start really changing their minds about. If you're involved yourself or if you, a man you know is involved in doing something that is immoral or coercive, you have to dissolve that relationship with that person. Or you have to tell them, if you're, you, this isn't rectified and changed and you're not doing a moral profession and you're not involved in right livelihood, the relationship cannot continue. You can continue to do that, but not with my support. Now, how many people are w willing and prepared to do that? You know, even if it means discomfort. No, nobody's telling you, I'm not up here telling you this is going to be an easy thing. Change is hard. You might have to suffer. You might have to go through hardship to do what's right. You know, it's not, it's not easy. It doesn't mean that it's impossibly complex. It's real simple. Stop doing things that are violent toward other people and stop supporting those things, even if it means you benefit from them. You know, I'm not doing a job where money is gonna go to pedophiles, people who I know are pedophiles. You know, I don't care how hard that makes my life. I'll live on at pauper level if I have to. I'm not, you're not, I'm not taking a job that's going to withhold my income and send it to pedophiles. People I know who are raping small boys and girls. Not that, not energy that I make. Sorry, you ain't getting that. Kill me if you want, but you're not taking it. All you'll get is a pound of my flesh, but you're not going to get any energy toward your sick, depraved ways. Now, how, until people are so doing that and so ready to think like that and act like that, that they're willing to die, don't expect it to change. That's what you have to do is stop supporting the system. Stop paying into the system. Stop supporting anybody who supports the system. This works in reverse too. Men need to have nothing to do with women who want anything to do with the state. 
okay? Those relationships should be dissolved, all right? You have to walk away from people if they insist, I'm gonna continue to support immoral ways and behaviors. That's a hard thing to want. I don't, I'm not interested in, in forming true, dynamic, interpersonal, intimate relationships with people who are non-anarchists. Not interested in it, you know? Because that person is not on an equal level when it comes to consciousness. So I'm, I'm what, gonna support somebody that continues to support violence conducted against me and people I care about? No, I'm not gonna tolerate that, you know? I understand if you've woken up and you've already been in a relationship, that could be a hard one. I'm talking about forging new relationships particularly, you know, or, you know, if a woman's married to a soldier, or married to a cop. You know, these are people who are boots on the ground creators of the enslavement system. And women have to stop supporting them and walk away from those relationships. And men need to do the same when it comes to women who support the state. So people don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear it as a solution. But I'm telling you, it's one of the things that would radically transform this society if people started doing it. Uh, I want to step back a slide there, not only to read that quote, but I want to tell you who that woman is. Uh, words of the Buddha, blessed are they who earn their livelihood without harming others. The Buddhist concept of right livelihood. The woman on the right there is Margaret Gage. And she is, I, I would actually say I dedicate the spirit of this presentation to Margaret Gage because she embodies exactly what I'm talking about here and what I was talking about last night. She was an inauthentic woman who became an authentic woman in her lifetime. She was the wife of Thomas Gage. Thomas Gage was the uh, English general who conducted the main military warfare campaign against the American revolutionaries in the American Revolutionary War. She was his wife of many years from New Jersey, went over to England, had many children with this general. He was appointed to be the main commander of, of English troops in America. She came over here with him and had a change of heart when she saw the oppression that was being done to Americans, her, where she was born, by the British. And she got involved in the American Revolution as a spy, one of the first women spies. And she gave intelligence to the American revolutionaries about the movements of British soldiers at incredible risk to her, her personal safety. And without her, many of the battles may not have gone the ways that they went in the American Revolution. This is what, probably one of the bravest women who has ever existed on this continent, if not the bravest. And that's an example for women, to, to, to go through the radical transformation from the inauthentic woman who's with the dominator to the authentic woman who is supporting the true freedom rebel, okay? Uh, thank you. Could not ask for a better example of a genuine woman than someone like Margaret Gage. We have to invoke and create the sacred union, the, the holy matrimony between the sacred masculine and the sacred feminine, the sacred feminine principle of non-aggression and the sacred masculine principle of self-defense. And also the marriage within us of the sacred masculine of the logical mind and the heart-based intelligence. So intellect plus um, care. That's what true holistic intelligence is all about. And these dynamics drive each other. Emotional thinking is a feminine trait. It gets you to care about what is right and true. You have to have that heart-based intelligence to really deeply care for truth. But logical and critical thinking is a masculine trait that gets you to figure out things and help to understand the solution regarding what is right and true. The awakened woman, and of course the awakened man, balances both of these modalities in consciousness. One cannot take precedence of, over the other. You have to balance them and bring them into full accord and unity with each other. That's the sacred union that we need to bring into balance within ourselves. Mastering yourself is true power. Sacred union is love under will, a thalamic concept. What does it mean? It means that if you're going to employ the sacred masculine principle of will, 
of right action in the world, underneath it must be care. Love has to hold the child, which is right action, being birthed into the world. That's what the traditional religious images of Madonna and child have all been about in classical Christian iconography. It's allegorical. You know, if you understand real esoteric Christianity, you know, this is care supporting in her arms right action and birthing right action into the world. The sacred feminine gives birth to the sacred masculine. It's a beautiful spiritual allegory if it's properly understood. And then the sacred masculine nurtures and uplifts the, the feminine in society as well through right action and example, which is what the Christ figure, you know, um, bringing up Mary Magdalene is about, and them having dynamic interchange of energy between themselves in a sacred union. Probably the most important solution anybody can employ is to consciously parent the young. Conscious, be a conscious parent of children. <laughs> Folks, do not sugarcoat the truth to your children. They will call you on your bullshit. Okay? Teach them the truth at a very early age. Do not try to shelter them from reality. Speak plainly and simply to them. They can understand. Okay? They're, they're, they're more resilient than you think they are, too. They can take more than a person who's already been conditioned for half their lifetime can take. Be honest with them. Feed them good nutrition, healthy, nutritious meals. You know, make them active. Build them strong. Build them up strong. They got to be strong beings. This isn't about just, you know, nurturing them emotionally. It's got to be physical too. The emotions, of course, have to be there. But we have to build strong people who are going to actively resist this immoral system. Not only mentally and psychologically, and philosophically, but physically, if necessary. You know, incredible meme here. I will not sentence my children to a future without liberty. That's what that needs to be every parent's primary concern. I've talked to actual parents and said they're, they're taking freedom away not only from us, but the future generations. And, and I've heard back, all I can worry about is putting food on my table. I'm like, you don't love your children. I'll say that right to a parent's face, and then they'll get all over my ass for saying that to them and saying, I have no room to talk because I don't have a child. And they'll say, oh, you didn't take the responsibility of having a child, so you are not qualified to say that? Bullshit. I'll say it right to a parent's face who says they're not concerned about freedom. You don't love your goddamn children. I love them more than you. Just because you... Put a child out of your loins doesn't necessarily mean that you know everything that's going on in the world and what's best, you know? You know, what, because I can't speak to that because I didn't have a child? Nonsense. So, you know, that, we have to get on parents' cases like this because they're failing. They're not doing their job. They're not nurturing or raising their children. And it's because of this diminished familial bond between men and women. It's largely what's driving that bad parenting dynamic. So I highly, highly recommend the works of Lennon Honor on conscious parenting because he's done a lot of great work on that. And many others. Awakening the sacred masculine is as important as awakening the sacred feminine. And I'm talking about awakening this dynamic across the board in both genders, particularly in women. You know, more women have to get behind the notion of legitimate rebellion. There are such things as legitimate physical rebellions, you know? And it does, that, that, they're not putting the line on there for no reason. It's, it's an understanding of courage and sacrifice and what may have to be done, even though it's incredibly uncomfortable and distasteful. If your woman isn't a revolutionary, she will persuade you to be a slave and to accept those conditions of slavery willingly. That's why we need more women rebels. Yeah. 
quote by Annie Oakley, I would like to see every woman know how to handle firearms as naturally as they know how to handle babies. So would I. Resistance is victory. Resistance, ladies and gentlemen, is victory. What we need to ultimately do is to wake up to the manipulation and resist it on all fronts. Information regarding this occult agenda can be extremely difficult for the victims of its manipulation to hear. And I'll tell you what, women are some of the biggest victims of this manipulation. The neo-feminists think that women are gaining power by this agenda, you're being enslaved by it, along with the men in society. It can be very difficult for the victims to hear, but when you finally recognize the methods and goals of this epigenetics agenda, you will wake up and see the programming, exactly like when Neo wakes up in the Matrix and he can see the code in the Matrix, which is when he gains all the power he needs to fight back. Resistance, because if we fight, we might lose. But if we don't fight, we've already lost. <laughs> Folks, we're at war. It doesn't matter if you don't like the, the term fighting and resistance, you're at war. War is being waged on you now, already. It's not coming, it is, has been ongoingly waged upon you and your children. That's what has to be consciously recognized, and it's time to fight back. When the conscience is denied its freedom, when the workings of society hamper the artist, the musician, the poet, the philosopher, in short, the thinker, it is time for the instinct of rebellion to declare a state of war. That's where we're at. And make no mistake about that, ladies and gentlemen, that is not just, we're not talking about just the gender war. This is the worldwide spiritual war that is ongoing on this planet. And if we're gonna win it, and yes, there is such a thing as winning it, somebody asked me this question last night. Is there such a thing as winning and losing? Absolutely there is, yes. You know, you don't like polarity, tough. It's legitimate and real. Losing this war is being enslaved and, go and making this planet a living hell, which is already rapidly on its way to being, if not already there. And winning it is being free, having and expressing your natural human rights as a being, and going on to higher states of consciousness and building things that we could scarcely even imagine that we can do, and realizing the true human potential. That's winning. And if and that's a choice, the choice between what's gonna happen in this war is for us to make. That's the good news about all of this. We change our minds and we change our consciousness, we change our behavior, we can choose to, for that better result to happen and actually quote unquote win. Simultaneously, we choose to stay where we're at in this low state of consciousness and not do the great work. You know, we're gonna lose big time and we're gonna end up in hell. See, it's, it's all about the lost word, saying no, resistance. This is spiritual immunity to the whole satanic mindset. Neo gained his power when he said no, finally. And that's when he woke up consciously in the matrix and can see all the code and see what it was really made of. He could see the truth as it really is when he spoke the word no. This is one of my favorite quotes on earth. It was from the comic book, Captain America. I'll give a brief anecdote. I know I'm going way over time, but it's worth it. The, I was in, I was in a, a local pub and I was wearing the hoodie that I wore right after I finished my speech last night when I went out for a bit after uh, the conference concluded last night. It is a uh, black hoodie with the Gadsden snake on it. And uh, I was sitting outside of this venue, this music venue, and a guy came up to me outside and started trouble with me just because he didn't like the original American iconography of the rebellion and freedom of this country. One American going up to another American and starting a problem when I was sitting there not speaking to any living soul, minding my own business, okay? 
what's your snake about? I said, it's uh, the Gadsden flag snake. Don't tread on me. It's one of the it was actually the first flag of America. They flew it at the Battle of Bunker Hill. Uh, it was created by Christopher Gadsden of South Carolina, one of the militiamen who helped unite the militias in the American Revolution. Uh, oh, yeah? Uh, I, I, see, I see that with these uh, militia types today. And you, you guys think you're going to fight against the police and the military? And I was like, well, uh, since you asked, uh, if it has to come to that, I said, I guess that's up to you. I, are you in the police and military? I guess that would be up to you guys if you are. You know? And he goes, he, he, he looked at, I had uh, some other, I guess, he, he thought I was in the military. He goes, what branch did you serve in? I'm like, I'm in the people's militia. I didn't serve in any branch of the military. Okay? You know, I, I'm for just freedom. That's it. And he goes, oh, what are you, one of these anarchists? And I said, actually, I am an anarchist. You know, I don't believe in the authority of the state. <clears throat> so his, his girlfriend was there and was listening, and I started to explain what anarchy meant etymologically. It comes from the Greek uh, an, which means uh, absent or not present, and the word archon in Greek, which means master or ruler. And when I explained that, his girlfriend like suddenly turned very lot like had this logical look on her face like wow yeah I, that makes a lot of sense because it means you know the absence of ruling anybody and the absence of ruling means there's there's no slavery so you're free I said exactly that's what that's what it means he got so angry that his girlfriend agreed with me when I explained the etymological meaning of anarchy that it's like this rage came over his face and he said to me if you don't like it here. Why don't you move? <laughs> and I said, well, I'll answer that question. I remained very, very calm. As a matter of fact, a friend of mine was sitting there watching the whole thing, and uh, he, he knew I asked for no part of this conversation. The guy was clearly in, intoxicated, actually. And I, you know, repeatedly said, you know, nothing's going to be proven or resolved here. You know, we're sitting outside of a pub talking about political issues, like, you're not going to convince me of anything different. I'm not going to convince you of anything different. I don't even know why you're bothering with this. And his girlfriend was, you know, saying, yeah, he's right. Like, come on, let's go. But he was clearly visibly intoxicated from being inside drinking for a while, and he wanted to continue to pursue it. So he, he, he gave me this, you know, typical thing. If you don't like what, how we run things here, why don't you move? And I said, I will answer that question. I'm not going anywhere because I'm right. That's why I'm not going to move from America. Because I'm standing in truth and righteousness. I am in the right when it comes to moral reality. That's the reason I'm not going anywhere. I know the difference between right and wrong. I don't aggress against other people's rights, and no one should aggress against mine. And I'm living in those principles, and because I'm right about those things, don't expect me to leave. If anything, you should leave. Yeah. You can call that combative speech. I don't care what you call it. I said, you asked me, don't expect me to sit here like some timid little boy and not answer you, okay? And then his girlfriend pulled him away. <laughs> and I immediately thought of this quote from Captain America. Every time somebody says that to me, it goes right back to my childhood reading these comics. You know, and I remember this quote, one of my favorite quotes that he ever spoke in, in the whole comic book. And here's what it is. It doesn't matter what the press says. It doesn't matter what the politicians or the mobs say. It doesn't matter if the whole country decides that something wrong is something right. This nation was founded on one principle above all else, the requirement that we stand up for what we believe no matter the odds or the consequences. When the mob and the press and the whole world tell you to move, your job is to plant yourself like a tree next to the river of truth and tell the whole world, no, you move.
And that is the energy of the lost word, which people have to fall in love with and understand at a deep, deep core soul level. The word no is the most powerful word in the universe. When we say no, we reclaim all of our natural rights and we take back our power. And that means you have to be willing to defend those rights, not just philosophically, but physically if required to do so. And that's what our ancestors understood. And that's what too many of us have forgotten. Particularly women have to develop the courage to let go. Attachment is a big spiritual stumbling block when it comes to how the sacred, the true sacred feminine in all of us is manipulated. People want things to be orderly and peaceful and comfortable. We may not be able to get to where we want to go at the point that we're at in total comfort and peace and order. It may require a period of chaos. And we have to be willing to embrace that fearlessly if we're going to get to where we want to go. The control system has to go by any means necessary to dissolve it. It has to all burn down. Out of that chaos, the authentic man and the authentic woman will be the survivors and they will build the new world. In a society, thank you, in a society that has destroyed all adventure, the only adventure left is to destroy that society. A few people whose information you should look into, and once again, I offer the caveat, just because I list these people to look into their information, does not mean I agree with everything that they stand for politically, ideologically, socially, or anything. I just think they have some good information on the topics they talk about. Jim Keith, one of the greatest researchers that I've come across, he wrote the book Mass Control, Engineering Human Consciousness. If anybody hasn't read this book, it's unacceptable. It is a must read to understand social engineering. John Coleman, who wrote the book, The Tavistock Institute of Human Relations and many others, absolutely brilliant uh, historical researcher. Camille pa Paglia, who wrote Sexual Personae, absolutely brilliant discourse on neo-feminism. Stefan Molyneux, whether you like him, hate him, okay, or feel ambivalently about him, has put a lot of good work into the exposing of the neo-feminism agenda. Christopher Hitchens, again, politically leftist, but had so many great things to say about political correctness and how it's a form of censorship and the importance of maintaining free speech at all times. I think people would find value in looking up his work. Gary Allen, the author of None Dare Call It Conspiracy, a book that is out of print, but I'm telling you, you can go online and get it, probably for still pretty cheap prices. If, if the people in this room, I need to know, by a show of hands, how many people have read in its entirely, in its entirety, None Dare Call a Conspiracy? Absolutely horrific, I'm horrified. No, I'm serious. I'm not even joking, it's not funny. That's horrifying. People need to read that book. It's that important about what's going on in America right now. This man seems like a prophet in this book for what he told people was coming. And it's all happening because he knew the people who were actively running this agenda, just like I know uh, some of them that were actively running this agenda. I'm telling you, that book is a must read. Get it and read it through in its entirety. Janice, Fiamma uh, Janice Fiamango and Christina Hoff Summers, also two uh, pretty uh, good analysts when it comes to uh, breaking down some of the uh, ideologies that are contained in neo-feminism and very much worth checking out their work. Ultimately, the solution is to do the true great work, which sadly people don't want to accept, is to help drag people kicking and screaming to the truth. Whether you accept that, want to accept it or not, it doesn't matter. Until we get involved in doing the great work of helping to be the transformers of other people by encouraging them to look at the truth, 
don't expect things to change. The true great work is to help people to abandon the false and dogmatic beliefs which have been holding back the progress of consciousness and impeding the reception of truth and natural law. The true great work is the arduous task of influencing others to realize that in supporting and condoning the legitimacy of authority, that they have actually been supporting and condoning the legitimacy of slavery and that they were immoral for having done so. That is the ultimate true great work that we need to do. Smaller parts of it include exposing the sub-agendas like the gender war and the neo-feminism agenda and the eugenics agenda. It's all part of the true great work to bring that work to others. I call this the law of one in zombie land. <laughs> That's what the true great work really is. You know, and there's a uh, good old Rick from The Walking Dead, you know, looking at the zombies and saying, you're telling me that we're all one? Yeah, that's right. We are unfortunately attached to those who are unconscious and unaware. As unpopular as it is to hear for many people, we live in a shared reality and we will all share the same social fate. Maybe not the same fate at a soul level, but the same social fate because the same shared manifestation is gonna happen for all, whether they're conscious or unconscious. If we wanna change the world for the better without experiencing large scale societal chaos and disaster, our one great work lies in waking the walking dead. Make no mistake about it. The zombies do have to be awoken. Too many people think that this does not need to occur. I'm telling you, we are connected with those. We are not separate from them. We are not separate from the unconscious. You can call them the sheep all you want, the dead, the unbegun, does the uninitiated, the profane, the unwashed masses, it doesn't matter what you call them. You better get to work on waking them up because they're making decisions about what happens with your life. They affect your freedom. Their ignorance affects all of our freedom. That's what the true great work is, is to make the darkness conscious. And people ain't interested in that work. You know, they're interested in maintaining their comfort level, not rocking the boat, and not getting in arguments with people, and not being hated by your family members and so-called friends. Maybe that's what needs to happen. Maybe tension and division is what needs to happen when it comes to moral issues. This is what the words of Christ mean in the New Testament when he says, I came not to bring peace to the earth, but a sword, the sword of truth. The goddess reborn. The unholy feminine currently reigns supreme in our world, but ask yourself the question, if women as a whole reawaken the sacred feminine within themselves, the principle of care, just how much would they be capable of transforming the overall consciousness of humanity? And I would suggest the answer is radically, totally, revolutionarily. That's how much. Women are the traditional nurturers and caregivers of our entire society. If anything, they hold the fate of humanity in their hands. You are more powerful than you know, and they fear the day you discover it. We have to break out of that shell and let the inner lion loose. Lose all the fear. Lose all the trepidation. What are we waiting for? We're the ones we've been waiting for. We're the answer. We need to put the truth out there for ourselves and others. That takes courage to do. We have to step into that lion energy. When sleeping women wake, mountains move. It's all about the sacred union, that sacred familial bond between man and woman that is the core strength of human society. The dark occultists don't want that to manifest, but if we set aside all of these divisive things and we bring that sacred union into manifestation, we can turn this planet from a prison to a paradise. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your kind attention.
Mark Passio.